Hello and welcome to the uh, Spark Gaming Podcast. I'm here with Parsons Media Studios. How do media gigs on this fine Friday evening? Indeed. Um, at the current of this um, my little podcast recording, it's currently the 13th of April. I have to check if the microphone is working. Yes, it is. So I apologize for the loud voice, but you know, you gotta double check sometimes. So, um, because Parsons Media Studios is here, I thought we have a look at movies, obviously. And in celebration of uh, the Marvel Infinity War coming out, we're going to discuss the Disney Marvel movies. So, any of the Sony Spider-Man movies or the previous Hulk movie that came out in 2004 or five I can't remember. 2003. Yeah, 2003. It will not be here. We're only going to look at the um, the Disney Marvel films starting with Iron Man that came out in 2008. And we're just going to work our way up to, you know, where we are now. We're going to do little reviews of it. So not a full length review, but maybe a full length review. But it doesn't matter because this is a podcast. So I'm here with my Disfono and uh, Elliot is here with his Copperberg. Hmm. To 10 years of ah. the MCU... Mm-hmm. And to another ten. Indeed. So I suppose we um, we should start off with Iron Man, of course. Of course, the one that starts it all. In two thousand and eight. What's really funny is that um, apparently, like Tom Cruise was going to be the original um, Tony Stark, and and Leonardo DiCaprio was also considered yeah. for the role. Imagine how different it would be now if like if Tom Cruise or Leonardo DiCaprio was. I could see. Tom Cruise is the part, but I would never really see um, Leonardo DiCaprio as that, you know, Tony Stark. Tom Cruise looks like it, and I can understand why, but um, Robert Downey Jr. has kind of already painted that picture. Hmm. Right now, it's hard to believe it's been 10 years since Iron Man came out, because we were 10 years old when when the MCU began, and really, and really, it's hard to believe that Ten years on, we're already eighteen films in. Looking ahead to the third Avengers film, and and just looking up to to, to to the man really who stars it all, which is Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Mm. I mean, how, I mean, the, I mean, the first film really was a was in my mind a, a, a game changer for the for the comedy genre in cinema history because, well, not only did it accelerate the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it started one of one of one of one of the greatest superheroes in I think comic book history as well as superhero movie history. Hmm. True, I suppose, but in my perspective, I would say it sort of paved the way in um, in the Disney Marvel kind of thing because I I remember um, it was technically the the Spider Man movies that from Sony that really kicked it off, but um, and the X Men Di- movies, yeah, and but Disney Marvel sort of got a stronghold in it like you know, a movie after movie movie after movie they always managed to find a big success and I can understand why um, it's I think it's like the second most successful Marvel film uh, Iron Man um, I remember um, when it came out in 2008 um, I heard about Marvel I've um, I've known about its you know heroes because I've watched the 90s uh, Spider-Man cartoon so I know little about the other heroes. I knew mainly about Spider-Man, and I'm pretty sure loads of people can agree me with me on this. Because if you were growing up, you would have seen um, on Jetix the '90s Spider-Man show, which um, took its stories from the actual comics, and um, it even did a cameo of Stan Lee as a character at some point, as well as um, showing other Marvel superheroes like Captain America and Iron Man. So, when I learned about Iron Man, I was watching an episode of 90 Spider-Man um, where Venom and Carnage would team up against uh, Spider-Man and War Machine came in to step in and I thought, War Machine? I, I didn't know that was in the Spider-Man universe, but when I looked it up, I was like, oh, what is this Iron Man stuff? So, when I heard there was a movie about it, I was like, I might as well see it to you know gain more knowledge about it and there you go, I thought it was a really good film. Well, Iron Man grossed five hundred five hundred and eighty-five point two million dollars at the at, at the box office during its few appearance run. 
and it, uh, and and it was doing the other point a box office su 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 success thanks thanks uh, thanks to performances of Robert Downey Jr., Gwyneth Paltrow, Terrence Howard, and Jeff Bridges, and the and the whole cast really. Mm. He was very um. He, he was good how it, it dealt with themes like um, terrorism and um. The use of like power. Exactly. I guess that's what Iron Man is all about because um, Tony Stark is sort of like this billionaire playboy. He's like, oh, I'm doing this and this. Until his eye was like, his whole world was changed when, you know, she he got she Iron Man. It's not a she. He got a taste of you know his own weaponry, and that's how it really started from there. What's really fascinating to me is that um, the his best friend Rhodes was it, is a roadie, James Rhodes. Yeah, Rhodes. That's it. He uh, was played by a different actor, Terence Howard. Yeah, Terence Howard. But unfortunately, he didn't really get apparently he didn't really get along with the crew um, during the film set of Iron Man. So hence the reason he wasn't really seen again in the second film because he was he was replaced by uh, Don Cheadle. Yeah, who is the more I see him as the more you know Rhodes kind of look. Me guy. too. Mm. So obviously, Iron Man was a big success. Um. Uh, why think of the villain? What do you think of the villain, Iron Monger? Um, I will admit, I really, I, I really liked him. I think he was definitely one of, I think he's definitely one of one of the strongest MCU villains that the, the, the we've had in the last ten years. Mm, I don't know about that. I would, I would say he's a strong contender. Other than that, he doesn't really have much of a backstory. He's kind of like, oh, I just want to make money. I want to have power, and it's not that kind of original villain backstory I suppose. Not really, no. Because I suppose Disney was giving it like sort of like a one shot to see what would happen. So I suppose they were kind of taking a risk there by not really giving Iron Monger much of a backstory. But if he did have like a backstory to it, like, you know, his daughter might have died or hence reason he's wanting to have this power or something, it would make sense. But from what I see of the movie um, he's nothing more than just, you know, what his name suggests. He's just a power monger. But I will say his his armor looks really terrifying. It looks really well done, especially with um the CGI. I think pretty much just to clear this all out, the CGI effects in um the Marvel movies have been you know really fantastic. Same with the acting as well. So we don't have to talk too much about the acting, but yeah, that's that's really been a good thing for the Marvel movies to have mm. such superb acting and CGI effects even though some of the movies may have a, the things where it's a bit off but it's generally just you know ignored by the superb afterwards so I suppose for Iron Man the first Iron Man I would have to give it a 9 out of 10 um, 9 because again superb story superb Iron Man love it all I just wished Ironmonger had more of a villain backstory to him so yeah, I can too. understand why he wanted to do that. Yeah, he should have definitely gone the backstory. Yeah. So what's next on the list? So, now we're now moving on to the second installment of the MCU, which was The Incredible Hulk, as released in June 2008 and grossed um, $263.4 million at the box office. Now, following the mixed response to the 2003 film Hulk, Marvel Studios immediately re re reacquired the rights to the character, and and yeah, in, in 2008, Edward Norton took took on the role of uh, Bruce Banner, and the film uh, and the film received positive reviews from from, 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 from the critics alike, and, and Norton was set to re to reprise the role in the Avengers and any other f future installments. Yeah, but, but however, he was replaced by Mark Ruffalo. Um, it was apparent again. It was the same thing with uh, Rhodes. They Edward Norton didn't really feel like he was. Ex well, it's a bit different, I would say. Even though they both left the Marvel Studios on their first film, um, Edward Norton uh, left because of creative differences. He felt like you know his act. He didn't feel like he was putting enough creative element in the Bruce Banner character. If I had to be honest, I prefer Edward Norton's Hulk to the Mark Hamill. Hulk because Mark with, Ruffalo. Yeah, Mark Ruffalo's Hulk because um it was more gritty. Like um it was more detailed Hulk, if you get my meaning. Mm. And I, I would say it's one of my favourite films because um it was the Hulk is an interesting kind of hero. Well, it depends really, because you can't really call him exactly a hero. No, you can't. Because he's 
he kind of smashes up everything in his way. So he's more like an anti-hero in I, some way. Yeah, I'd say he's more of an anti-hero. Is is again? It's just a like Doctor Jekyll fan. No, what do you call it? Jekyll Hyde, Mister Jekyll and Hyde. Hmm. So you know you can't exactly say he's a hero, but um, I will say that like uh, again, it's it's hero side of the thing. Um, sorry, villain side of the thing. Again, it it falls flat on its villain side of the thing because. Although we are treating a bit more to the villain, how you know he thinks he's the best, but then he gets absolutely smacked by the Hulk in that scene in the college where, like, you know, when he comes to the Hulk, he says, "What are you gonna do?" and he just kicks him in front of the tree. Yeah. I find that very hilarious. Um, it's unfortunate because um, he, he he was a weak villain in my mind. Yeah, but at least we got the a beautiful abomination versus the Hulk fight, which is, mm. is one of my favorite fight scenes in the Marvel universe. And it creates the iconic moment of using police, you know, boxer gloves for mm. the Hulk. I think, in my opinion, the Incredible Hulk, whilst whilst I, whilst I thought it, it was a good film, I think it was I think it was more of more one of the weak weak installments of the MCU because it just because because whilst I did enjoy it, I, it, I don't know I just particularly didn't I wasn't as overly as keen on it. As as well, what, what I hoped it would be. Hmm. Uh, I suppose because um, again, like Hulk is it's kind of a difficult um hero, but it's kind of like you know, do you like destruction? There you go, there's destruction for you. But I which I really don't mind because I like your um hero concepts where you can't exactly call them a hero. It it depends on your you know what you define as a hero. So I define Hulk as like an anti-hero, but I will say it does have um. <clears throat> It's interesting to see they don't go for like the typical, you know, as soon as him being normal, then it being exposed to the radiation, because that's what the two thousand and three movie did. But in the in this version, the when did it come out again? Two thousand eight. Yeah, when it, in the two thousand and eight movie, he um, they already skipped that part and went for a scene where it's like, okay, so he already knows he's the Hulk. Everything has just happened and everything. Here's him trying to lead a normal life, and then things just go hmm. pickety ponky. <laughs> Well, what was also one one of those in, in, interesting parts of that film is in in the post credit scene when uh, Tony Stark made made an appearance in that. I was actually pretty shocked to that, see um, Iron Man there, and I, and I actually didn't really have a clue about what he said by building a team together. Because oh, we should also say that in the post credits of Mar- of Iron Man as well, again Nick Fury when he first appeared, I was like, who is he? What bit? What team? So then again, it was like team it, thing. It was kind of foreshadowing the Avengers in that post credits scene. Yeah, when Tony Stark said said to said said to said to uh, said, said said to Ross, essentially, what if I was telling you that they're putting together a team? Uh, so essentially, that was that was uh, giving the, the the audience more more hints and teasers towards the Avengers, essentially. Yeah, and I do. I have to give credit to like the um the Hulk ending where um. Well, like he, um, that that part was a days of vids, days of like you know without an incident, and then he comes from like this number all the way to zero as he opens with the green eyes as he smiles. I love that scene. I love that scene. It's kind of just like yeah, you already know what's happening. Mm-mm-mm. So in conclusion, I would rate the Hulk um, about the about an eight out of ten. Because I'd say it's fair even though it's one of my favorite movies and I love it, I would say it has a bit of wasted opportunities because it did, yeah. um, again the villain just falls flat, doesn't really have any character development. Actually, no, no, sorry, I would give it a, the same score as Iron Man. It it has everything it's going for, but it keeps you know not developing a good villain arc for the main villain. So again, it just falls on that you know nine out of ten. Spectrum for me. What do you think? Um, yeah, I would. I personally give it eight point five out of ten, in my opinion. Hmm. For 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 I think the same reason as you, because 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 I think because I think again, like Iron Man, there was there was a wasted opportunity for the, for the villain. Didn't quite develop develop into the full potential. Really, it could have been. Mhm. Hmm. So, anyway, moving on to the third installment of the MCU. Mhm. Iron Man 2, which was the sequel to Iron Man, 
So, so in Iron Man 2, it picks up six months after the events of the first film. And in those six months, Tony Stark has been has been resisting calls by the United States government to hand over the Iron Man technology, while whilst also dealing with his the the decline health from the from the art reactor in his chest. But when a when, when a Russian scientist called Ivan Yanko t- t- develops the same technology as Stark and builds weapons of his own in, in order to pursue p- pursue a um venator against Stark family. In the process, he joins forces with Star's business rival Justin Hammer to try and take him down. Mm. Now, now notes about this film: this is this is this is the first film to feature Don Cheadle as James Rhodes, aka War Machine, following following the um, departure of Terence Howard, who, as I said earlier, left left because of creative difficulties. But this is also the, the first film to feature Scarlett Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow. Who makes her who makes her first appearance as the character ahead of the Avengers, and, and also features Nick Nick Fury and Phil Coulson in larger roles as a, as a, as opposed to the first film, mm. and it grossed at the box office six hundred twenty three point nine million dollars at the at the at the box office worldwide, so it was um so it was um better so so we grossed more than the first Iron Man and it again was generally generally positive. Reviews and the critics alike. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. So Tom, what are your thoughts on Iron Man Two? Iron Man Two. I would. I would say it's um. It has a good sequel. It's one of those movies where like it actually does good. Whenever we hear that movies get a sequel, where we get a bit worried because um it might not live up to the first film. But I think with Iron Man, I think that's the good thing about you know uh, Marvel's Disney. They're able to consistently, you know, make um, good, you know, follow-ups to their movies. So with Iron Man 2, I was dead anxious to see it. Like, I begged my parents to see it, and we eventually got there. (laughs) Um, I remember um, liking War Machine, and I remember how many years that. uh, I actually played the video game first, then I saw the movie. But luckily, the video game doesn't really focus on the movie it kind of div- it kind of goes on its own I thought it was really good um, again interesting villain in some way at least the villain was a bit more interesting but again it just does not feel that kind of so why do you hate that particular person no backstory really yeah Justin Hammer um, he may have had a backstory in the comics but Again, the Disney Marvel don't really take full advantage of that. They kind of just say he's we, this business rival to Tony Stark. We we see how he why 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 he wants to outshine Tony Stark. Yeah, it's just business rivalry, nothing else. With um, Whiplash was his name. Whiplash. Yeah. yeah, with him, he had sort of a backstory there. Like he was there, like he had a reason to. So that's good. But I feel like he had a bit of a wasted potential because he doesn't really have that much involvement in the film. And in fact, the actor who played um, Whiplash had the exact same problem. He felt like, uh, again, he couldn't put much creativity in the film. And I think that's a it's a bit of a trend in the Marvel movies because even though it grosses like loads and loads and loads of uh, millions of money at the box office, uh, some of the ca- some of the actors um, say that you know they they just didn't enjoy their time or like they couldn't put much creativity in their character. So it's the, so with Whiplash it was the exact same thing, and it's the same with um, Edward Norton. Wait, is it Edward Norton? Who played the Hulk? Yeah. Yeah, Edward Norton. Yeah, again he um, couldn't put much creative difference in his you know character. So. With Whiplash, he was an interesting villain. He had a he had a reason to hate Tony Stark, but he wasn't shown as much. No, he wasn't. Yeah. I mean, he, I mean, I mean, had they um, had had they had time to to, to like tell some of some some of his backstory, I think that would definitely made his villain more stronger than how it turned out. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I think, and the same for Justin Hammer. Really, having having them to have potential, but. If we at least got the gone backstory as to how they became the people they were, I think I think Iron Man Two could could have could could have definitely shown 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 their full potential as uh, as villains essentially. What I will say though is that um, he gave me again another brilliant fight scene with um, 
Tony and Rhodes against like millions of other Iron Man, you know, clones. The they, drones from yeah, where they fully um, used the power of their armors. That was really brilliant, in my opinion. Oh, the, oh literally, the, the, the visual effects in that in that scene they were they were brilliantly done. Yeah, just that just that that scene I think was the was the, was for me this standout moment of Iron Man two. I just like the um the like the minigun turns on his shoulder as it like swings around to shoot. Mm. Who's, I'm just like you've won my heart. <laughs> so in conclusion, again, just nine point nine out of ten. For me, again, just great characters, great story, Amazing film. but focus on the villain. That's all I can say. What about you? Yeah, I definitely, I, I, I definitely agree. True, having, having, having definitely a, a worthy successor to the first film, and, uh, and, and yeah, I think Marvel just needs to concentrate on on their villains' backstories in the future in order to make them look more intimidating and more interesting to the audience. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, that's Iron Man 2 done. So, moving on to, to, to the fourth film of the MCU. So, so in May 2011, making ma making his debut on onto the big screen. Wait, 2008 and then 2011? No, no, 2008, 2010 was Iron Man 2. Oh, right, yeah. So, yeah. moving on to 2011. It's, it's so hard now that I think about it, like 2008 to 2010, because normally I'm just used, I'm now used to like each new year that was a new Marvel film, so it's a bit. It feels odd to have that gap. Yeah, as as I was saying, in May two thousand eleven, making his making his big screen debut was four. Ooh, four. Uh, of course, played by played by the amazing talented Chris Hemsworth. Uh, also featured, also featured one of one of the greatest British actors, Tom Hilston, as his brother Loki. And Anastasia Portman, Idris Elba, and Anthony Hopkins in, in the cast, and the film grossed four hundred and forty nine point three million dollars at the at the box office, and and in the film the the the, the, the basic plot of four is the he's the he's the prince of Asgard and 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 he's banished to Earth and stripped of his powers after he reunites the dominant war, so as and then, and then and his brother Loki plots to take the throne for himself. For 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 has proven himself worthy and uh, reclaim his hammer. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Um, Mjolnir. <laughs> Mjolnir. See, yeah, see I, I, I just can't pronounce this. It's so <laughs> hard to say. Um, because it's um, it's um, they. Mjolnir. The, yeah, they they took it from Norse myth uh, mythology. Norse myth mythology. Yeah, yeah that's no it. Yeah. So. So I will go first this time. We're stating my opinions about four. Sure. So. Now four. This was. This was a very interesting film, in, in my in, in my opinion, because when I because because when I first watched it, I um well, I wasn't I wasn't sure first how how film version of four was going to work, mm. but when I when I when I walked in, and I watched it, I I I actually thought, I, I was I was actually surprised because it was a pretty good film in my in my opinion. It definitely. It, it it definitely exceeded some expectations. I mean, I mean, the things I loved the most were the visuals and and the acting from Chris Hemsworth and Tom 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 Hiddleston was just incredible. Cause I cause I loved the kind of relationship between between Thor and Loki because 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 Loki's like the uh, the, the, the the god of mischief, whereas Thor's the older overprotected over brother trying to keep him in place. And and that was definitely one aspect of, of the film by light, but. Um, well, the villain, well, was was obviously Loki, and I personally can't fault Loki because I think he was I think he was a brilliant choice for the villain, and I think, and I and I and I, I think I think including Phil Coulson in the film again definitely definitely helps seed more seed more hints and teasers for the Avengers, as well as including the first appearance of Hawkeye, even if it was just a cameo appearance, mm -hmm. but. But uh, but yeah, not yeah, not a bad star for um for the God of Thunder. So um, Tom, what's now, your opinion on for? Mine is completely different. I I don't really class it as a bad movie. I think it's a good movie, but I've only seen it once because so, so have I actually. Unfortunately, it it's not one of those films that makes me want to come back to um because. I don't know, like, Thor was interesting, the character was good, but the 
over everything else, that there's nothing really that keeps me interested in wanting to keep watching it or wanting to come back to it because um, I've seen it like such a long time ago, and to this day, I've only seen it once. But I still, rem but I barely remember it because it was just not that interesting to me. But I will give it credit because Loki does actually have a reason for you know wanting to be better because um, it was pure jealousy, you know that Thor is this you know better brother whilst Loki is you know seen as this weak and elder kind of weak and sorry weaker brother to Thor so he wants you know to prove that he can be better so that actually gives a reason to why you know he wants to you know take over you know Asgard Asgard and everything I the jokes are funny I do like the part where like you know he says are you messing with the god of thunder and he gets tased by like a by a um the hospital set and just goes Ugh. oh and the drink scene where he says right more please yeah oh my god that was that was one of the, that, that, that was one of the best jokes in my mind. Mm -hmm. One of the um, what was it again? Um, the outfit looks great. I do like Thor's outfit a lot, but uh, it's I would give this movie about a seven point five out of ten because even though it has great acting, a great CGI, and a good villain backstory, it's not interesting enough to keep me watching because. Even though Thor is a, sounds like a great idea for a Marvel hero and everything, I'm just not that interested in him to make me keep watching it because if I look at um, the first Iron Man film, the reason why I wanted to keep watching it is because it was not a superhero gotten super strength or anything. It was just a normal man with technology. And it showed you know him changing through the world because of what he did. Um, with, with the Hulk... It was him struggling with becoming the Hulk, that he's this monster that everyone sees and he's struggling to find a cure to his, you know, illness or, you know, his power. Well, well so, where it was for, like, he didn't really kind of... It, it, it didn't really kind of, kind of become explain really why, 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 he, why he's the superhero, why he is for. Well, he is Thor because, you know, he's a Norse god and he's the god of thunder. So it's kind of already there. It's kind of already there. But you could say, well, isn't that similar to the Hulk? Yes, exactly. it is. But I would say there's a difference. With, again, with the Hulk, he's struggling to keep it, you know, this power and he wants to get rid of it. Whilst Thor is loving that he's the god of thunder. He's egotistical. Hence the reason he's sent to Earth and blah, blah, blah. So... And again, with Iron Man 2, the reason why I wanted to keep watching it is because Tony was going through a crisis with this heart, and, you know, that the world knew he was Iron Man, and they wanted technology from him. So, yeah, again, just 7.5. Great story, great everything, great villain. Could have done more. Yeah. Okay. So, next on the list. Okay, so moving on to the uh, fifth instalment of the MCU. So, so released in July 2011. Next up on the line... We now this is the penultimate film before the Avengers. We we're introduced to, to to our final key component of the Avengers, and that was Captain America: The First Avenger. Now, now set in now set in the, the 1940s during World War Two. So this so this so this takes place about 60 years prior to the events of Iron Man. Captain he tells the story of Steve Rogers, a, a sickly man from from from, from, from Brooklyn who. Who, when he enlists, who when he um, enlists to join the army in, in, in the war against the Germans, he 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 takes part in this in in this experiment and gets his super serum put, put into his body, they're, they're, therefore transforming, transforming him into a super soldier, and therefore becoming Captain America, who leads who leads who leads the, the American army in 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 to find the Red Skull and the and the Nazi force who who intend to use. An artifact called the Tesseract as an energy source of world domination, but this is the interesting thing: the Tesseract is an Infinity Stone. Now, so so this was the first Infinity Stone we saw in the MCU. Therefore, therefore, it was beginning to hint at Infinity War later later down the line. 
Now, in the cast, obviously, obviously, obviously it stars Chris Evans as Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, who of course played Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, in the 2005 Fantastic Four film. It also, it also features Sebastian Stan as, as Bucky Barnes, who later goes on to become the Winter Soldier, former then black star Tommy Lee Jones, Hugo Weaving as the Red Skull, Dominic Cooper as Howard Stark, who's, who, who, who is the father of Tony Stark, and, and, British, and British actress Hayley, Hayley Atwell's featured as, as well, probably one of, one of those beautiful and most popular Marvel women, Peggy Carter. So, so um, now, Captain America, the first Avenger. I personally, uh, now, going into this film, I was a bit skeptical about it being a superhero film set in the Second World War at first, but after watching it, I was actually surprised because it did a really good job on on portraying how Steve Rogers wanted wanted to join the army, even though he was skinny and sickly. But mm. but then but, but then really after 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 the, the experiment turned turned him into Captain America, the back gave him a true purpose to serve his country. To fight the Red Skull alongside, alongside his team, his team who would help him, and well, I think it was definitely a, a, a very, a very good introduction to to Steve Rogers, and 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 of course the um, ending scene, of course, essentially set up the, the the Avengers. Essentially, it put like a confirmed like seal saying we are making the event. Well. I, I guess you can just say like well technically Iron Man 1 sort of already said yeah we're going to create the Avengers mm. kind of thing but again it was just a big step up and the film grossed 370.6 <laughs> million dollars at the uh, at the box office which which is considerably lower than than, 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 than the films that come before that but but yeah just um I th- I think it was gen I think it was gen generally 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 a good film I because I'm because I'm a, I'm a fan of war films. I, I, I like how I like some of the some of the some of the history used in the film to explain like Hitler and mm. um, and the other and the other major historical figures of that time. Yeah. So, so what was your opinion on the, on the first Avenger, Tom? So um, my interest with Captain America is actually rather interesting because <laughs> um, I didn't see the first um, you know the Captain America film because I wasn't really particularly interested in that you know idea Captain America Pfft, sounds stupid so I didn't watch it um, I saw Captain America in the Avengers film and then I saw the Winter Soldier so then I was like oh okay it was good from there um, I only saw the the Captain America film when I was in secondary school and it was on like those like you know we'll do whatever you want day or whatever so that was in like 2011 or something so that's when I saw it, and um, and I and I watched it again um, when I came back home to fill in the blanks because we only saw like about the halfway point of it. So then I carried up. So then when I went home, I watched the rest of it on like you know catch up TV or whatever. So uh, it's think- a bit of a mix for me because um, I I like World War Two films. They're always interesting to you know see you know how they portray history and you know how they portray the characters and everything with Captain America it was a bit of a mix for me um it's I wouldn't say it's on the level of Thor saying it's forgettable I would say it's it's a bit rememberable but for most of the time yeah most of the time it's rememberable but sometimes there are parts where I'm just like I don't really care or just typical you know, tropes or whatever. So with um, Steve Rogers, I would have to say the CGI on Steve Rogers looks a bit poor. Like, I could tell that that's not Steve Rogers. Like, I don't know, his head seemed completely disproportionate yeah. from the body. So you could easily tell that, like, you know, that's not what he actually looks like. And it was a bit odd to me that like I can understand a weak soldier you know applying for the army because that actually happened you know 13 year olds 14 year olds and 15 year olds didn't apply for the army in World War 2 to fight for their country hmm so 
with uh, Steve Rogers applying because he's a weakling, that makes sense. What I really don't get is that there are part, there are two parts which I really don't get. The first part is that he's just, you know, some, uh, you know, he is conveniently chosen to be part of the super soldier experiment, even though, you know, there are millions of others, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, soldiers that have a probably a stronger background than Steve Rogers that could easily apply for it, the um, program, but they went with Steve Rogers for some reason. But, and also the part where it's like he's becoming this Captain America class act. I, I get it's supposed to be a, a nod to the original Captain America because that's what he originally looks like. But if you think about it, this is a super soldier program. You know, that we're doing this and this and this. So why make that super soldier program do these little performances and such at the beginning? I thought it'd be more logical for them to, you know, actually go to battle instead of doing these fancy party things. Hmm. Well, one one interesting part about uh, about the character Captain America is, I think, I, I, I think one major point the film made was is that he didn't change who he once was. He just because just because he he went from Steve Rogers to the Super Soldier, he stayed who he was inside because that that's what was 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 born to him more in strength and everything else. He stayed. He, he stayed true to his beliefs. Just just because he, he changed into Captain America, he, he didn't stop believing in mm. his, his his beliefs because because he believed that um, the, the Red Skull could be taken down. And more importantly, he he supposedly sa sacrificed himself t t t to save the world from him. Yeah, uh, that's another thing I like to bring up. Uh, the villain Red Skull. <sighs> Unfortunately. For me, he is probably on my list of the worst villains in movies. Because he's not interesting at any bit. So this is what I mean by classical tropes. He's basically just, I'm a Nazi who believes in a higher power. Nothing else. To be That's honest. it. To be honest, I was I was I I wasn't too keen on the Red Skull myself. No, even though he's a classic, you know, Captain America villain, he's not that interesting one bit. He he because you kind of look at him and say, okay, he's an artsy, he wants to do this. How am I supposed to care? He was he was, he was very well. Uh, again, underdeveloped in my mind. Mm. And what's really funny as well is that. Um, is that they they had another problem? Uh, the actor for uh, the Red Skull again, he didn't really have you know he left the studio after playing the Red Skull. He didn't really enjoy his time there because again, Marvel didn't really give him the chance to fully Shine. express you know the Red Skull character. So, hmm. well, I highly doubt we're going to see like another like you know Red Skull kind of villain no you know coming back. Um, Bucky Barnes' death. Um, it was it was in it was sad to me because it actually meant something, you know that you know he, he this friend who's always sticked up for him. So it it was sad to um see him go. Yeah. And and I thought that like that was a really powerful moment in you know Captain America the First Avenger because again that um it was the same thing in the comics, but and what's really funny is that um in the comics they they. Um, Bucky Barnes was like the Robin of the um, the MCU. Yeah. So, so it was an very impactful death that you know made me sad for Captain America. So hmm. that that's a good thing that the movie has done. So in conclusion, I would give Captain America about an eight out of ten. Ten again. It's just that the, that wasted villain potential, but it was at a greater scale because. It was just a typical stereotype and a t and just poor, you know, development on the villain. So that didn't really make me care that much. But I would say that the ending part where, you know, they uncover Captain America, I can imagine, you know, how distressed he is that, like, you know, he's in another time now. You know, most of the people he's known now are probably dead. dead. Do we... And it must have been... Distressing for me, knowing that he went from from 1945 to 2011, and oh my god, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being in being in a state, be, be, being frightened, n not knowing what was going to happen. Yeah. So, 
so yeah, that so yeah, yeah, that's right. Double cast by the first Avenger. So we're on to, of course, the first major event of the MCU. The Avengers. Yeah, probably one of the um, the most grossing films in um, film history in, twen- in 2010. 2012. 2012. Oh, 2012. So, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so but, yeah. Yeah, it was a massive hit. Everybody wanted went to see it. Mm. It it basically showed the world that, you know, Marvel, you know, superheroes can make, you know, this kind of film where you don't have to rely on one superhero. You can make an entire film about all these superheroes in one movie having the having the having the important thing about the avengers was it proved to people that a, a shared universe can work and it I, 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 and what did I, and what i felt it did so well was bringing together all six all six main core members together when the, when the world most needed them. I would say it's four core members like Iron Man, Hulk, Captain America and Thor because when it comes to Black Black Widow and Hawkeye okay. they're like sidekicks. Yeah, they're kind of just like there. <laughs> Even though they are a core member of the Avengers they weren't really given their like, you know, proper movie kind of thing so yeah. they're kind of just there. So, But the, they did have shared, you know, development within this movie so that's good. So the Avengers roast... Gross over 1.5 billion dollars at the box office in 2012, uh, amongst it during during its theoretical run, and it was, and, it, and it also became the highest grossing film of 2012, just just only just beating Skyfall to it. Mm-hmm. But wow, um, well, what what was the Avengers? So interesting, interestingly, the Avengers was the first Marvel film I. I ever watched. Basically, that film, that film was the reason why I became a fan of the MCU. Because essentially, I was 14 when it came out, and I remember Christmas 2012. My brother got got, got me got me it on DVD for Christmas, and then and, and, and after watching Doctor Who, which was the main highlight on Christmas Day, me, Mum, Dad, and Harry all sat down in need to watch it, and oh my, it just blew me away instantly. Just. Honestly, I've never seen such such a fantastic film that you know really shows that um, the world the world can can rely on a team of superheroes when you most need them. Because be, because like Nick, because like Nick Fury said, there was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people. So 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 that when they needed us, we could fight the battles, but they never could. Mm-hmm. So it's the same here. Um, when I saw it in cinemas, then later I heavily requested to have the DVD. I still have the DVD to this day. Me too. And if I ever feel like you know watching a, a Marvel movie, a classic Marvel movie, I always stick on the Avengers because it's so because it's so f- fascinating to me. It's such a good movie it- to see you know the Iron Man, the Hulk, and everything you know team up together to fight Loki. It's so fun as well. Yeah. Is it? It's fun, engaging, and just entertaining for the whole family. And what's really funny is that um, even though Hawkeye, people don't care that much about Hawkeye, they they made him an important, you know, kind of character to the um, Marvel universe. But, 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 but that's what I liked in the film: the fact that Hawkeye had a had a had a larger role, and the fact that he was well Lo- Loki's puppet most of the time. Mm-hmm. At least that gave him some, some something to do during the film. Yeah, and also it showed him the people. It showed the people why he should be taken seriously. You know, managed to bring him down an entire aircraft, and you know his skills in archery and everything. You know, proving that you know he is not he is not a force to be reckoned with. He can easily beat you in a bar fight or any kind of thing, I suppose. So it's there's loads of things we could say about the the Marvel's event the Marvel no, what am I saying the Avengers movie because it's it's done such a great job in characters plot villain everything having a, having in my mind I give it a solid 10 out of 10 from 10 me. out of 10 and again we were given our little you know hint about Thanos in um, the post credit scene oh yes of course seeing seeing see, see Thanos make his first appearance in the um Postgres scene, you could you could tell yeah. that um, 
for the, for the uh, greater threat was uh, coming mm -hmm. later on. And I have to say, we would drink to that, so get your cup of burger and cheers to this. To, to, to 10 years of the MCU. Mm hmm. Mm. So, that's Sebastian Sebast Sebast Avengers, that's in a nutshell. We yep. had not the end of phase one, so now we're moving into phase two of the MCU. All right, so now, when we enter phase two, I like to say this now. Um, at this point, I, don't, I think I've seen. I don't know because at this point, um, I am I've become more grown up. So <laughs> I've seen these Marvel films, but some of these films I have not seen. I like to point that out right now. So Elliot has more of a experience because he's seen these films. I may have not. So I'll I'll just let you know uh, from this point on if I've seen them or not. But I can confirm for most of the um, most of two of phase two I've seen. For phase three, not so much. But carry on, Elliot. Okay, so so kicking off phase two with, with, with the seventh installment of the MCU was of course Iron Man three. Mm. The um, the the uh, the the third and final installment of the Iron Man trilogy. So. So Iron Man three was. What was again massively successful at the at the box office, grossing over 1.2 billion dollars at, at the box office, becoming the second MCU film to, to gross over 1 billion dollars. So, in Iron Man 3, it, it it picks up six months six months after the events of the Avengers, and Tony Stark has been has 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 has, 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 has been trying to deal with post traumatic stress disorder caused by the caused by the events of the Avengers. Whilst investigating a, a string of terrorist attacks led by led by a new, a mysterious new villain called the Mandarin, and he, and he also comes into conflict with, with, with an old enemy, Aldrich Aldrich Kil Kilman. Now, Iron Man Three. Now, it's always the third film in the trilogy that doesn't that doesn't seem to do well, where like runs out of steam. So, well. What was interesting about Iron Man 3 was I liked how it dealt with the concept of Tony Stark dealing with, dealing with the aftermath of the Avengers, especially with his PT PTSD. P PTSD, thank you, yes. Um, yeah. Couldn't really have my mouth. Um, and then, well, the interesting thing I like, the, I like most about Iron Man 3 is the fact that and it's the same with the uh, Captain America Civil War for Ragnarok, which, I'll get, which we'll get to later. In Iron Man 3, essentially deconstructed Tony Stark, his character. Well, like, for example, the Mandarin blow, blowing up his mansion and destroying his suits, and um, essentially, uh, and then and then his arc reactor removed. Essentially, I felt this was like deconstructing Tony Stark, and and really bringing bringing his story to a close and setting him set and setting him on to. New event, new event, new adventures for like greater purposes. I found, and as for the, as for the Mandarin, the villain, whilst he did have kind of a backstory because because we saw him in in the in the flashback scene two nineteen ninety nine when he was with Tony Stark. Yeah. So we kind of saw how 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 he how he became the person he was and why he hated Tony Stark. So. I say for that reason, I thought I thought the Mandarin was a good villain because he, he had a backstory and he, he actually for once had a purpose. So I think I think in my opinion, I think Iron Man 3 was actually a very sat sat satisfying conclusion to the to the trilogy. And I and I, 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 I think definitely the one 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 that set up his uh, future appearances in the later films. Now Tom, have you seen Iron Man 3? I have seen Iron Man 3. And um, uh, and what were your thoughts on the film? Well, it's interesting to me because um, um, I heard that Iron Man 3 was going to be like the closing book for Tony Stark. So it was, essentially. Wrapping up his story. And I will, I will say this now, it, it does a great job, you know, in you know how to close up Tony's story and everything. So it's a bit odd to me to see him in Spider-Man Homecoming and... Civil War and Age of Ultron. Everything. Because there was still more to him, and, and trust me, I'll get to spend my homecoming soon. But, well, back to Iron Man 3. It's a great story, in my opinion. It's good and every, in, you know, 
you know, what do you do with a hero that's that weak and something. But here's the main trouble with it. It comes after the Avengers. So Iron Man is technically still with S.H.I.E.L.D. So S.H.I.E.L.D. must have known that something bad has happened to him with the terrorist attacks. So why didn't they send Thor, Captain America, Black Widow, or any other hero that could have helped them? I don't know. They didn't do that. Like, for some strange reason, they just completely forgot that, oh yeah, uh, we've got the Hulk and everything, oh yeah, he's part of S.H.I.E.L.D. I don't understand why they completely forgot about that. Because, if you think about it, if um, Iron Man was attacked and everything, and then he's sent off somewhere, then they'll get the Hulk or someone from S.H.I.E.L.D. to find Iron Man, get him back to his feet, and then, you know, help him out. Instead of just staying there, instead of saying, oh no, we'll let him deal with it. It's kind of just like, what are you doing then? So, with the Mandarin, he was an interesting villain to me. But his back, his reason for becoming a villain is a bit weak, in my opinion. Like, I, I can see why he might hate Iron Man. It's just rather weak, in my opinion, because it was kind of just like, oh, just business, you know, disruption. Like, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I don't work with this kind, blah, blah, blah. But and then you're like, well, you move on from that. You don't decide, oh, I might as well bomb him. It's kind of just like, well, you're, that, that just shows you're a bit of a psychopath. And, you know, people would say, oh, everybody, every villain does that. And I'm like, yeah, but again, it's not good enough for me. If you just pass it off to say, oh, he's just a psychopath. It's kind of just like, well, that's just, a, that's called poor writing to me. You can't just, you know, play, say this villain is a psychopath. That's why he has to do this. You know, there has to be a proper reason, you know, to why he's doing this stuff. Like, let's let's take Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th. The reason why he killed everybody was because he was particularly ugly and they didn't like him, so they killed him. Like, they purposely threw him in the water to drown him. So he resembles this hatred for, you know, everyone that, like, you know, has you know, done this, uh, you know, terrible injustice to him, hence the reason he doesn't show any empathy. With Freddy Krueger, he's a pedophile, and, you know, it's a shame, but people have set him on fire, and then he becomes more mad when he realises that, you know, he can continue his filthy acts. So, these psychopaths have a reason. So, when it comes to Iron Man 3, and the villain Mandarin, it's a bit weak to me, because like I said, Killing Tony Stark just because of a simple business disagreement is really, really stupid to me. Un unnecessary. And unnecessary, exactly. But I will say that it again, um, it does fantastic work with like you know showing all the Iron Man armors he's created, and you know pu putting a story to a close. Hmm. Okay. So. For me, I would rate this movie about a eight out. No, I would, yeah, an eight out of ten. I mean, that's a reasonable um, rating for it. Mm -hmm. Right, so that brings it close to Iron Man three. So, on to the eighth installment of the MCU. So, in, in November two thousand thirteen, for for the uh, the Godfather himself returned to his second solo outing in For the Dark World. Now, Fall of the Dark World is often is often considered one of one of the weaker films of the MCU. I actually agree with that. It is Me too. It is a bit of the weaker, the weak, you know, Marvel films. Even though it stars like Christopher Eccleston as like you know one of the villains, the Ninth Doctor, which I I love Christopher Eccleston. I loved his role in Twenty Eight Days Later as the General. I loved his role in you know in Doctor Who. Obviously, I liked his role in GI Joe. So him as the as the elf Malekith 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 it's not that great unfortunately it was a bit of a letdown um well so but carry on sorry sure so in Fourth of Dark World it picks it, it, it picks a, a year after the, the, the events of the Avengers uh, and, and Loki's been locked up for 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 for, for obviously um, call, causing the battle in New York whilst Thor continues to defend to defend that Asgard and well, and is reunited with his with his uh, lover Jane Jane Foster, but but however Malekith, who is played by, uh, as Tom said, former former Doctor Who star Christopher Eccleston, he 
he he he threatens to take a, he threatens to um, to t tear apart the, the, the nine of lambs and intends to plunge them into darkness. So really, I I do agree. Whilst Fourth Dark World was definitely one of the weaker films of the MCU. He wasn't that bad at Willamette. It, 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 it's, it, it's not like f forgettable or anything. It, um, it did have some good humour and it was, uh, and the acting w was good, but, but like Tom said, Malekith w w w was just a weak villain in my mind. There wasn't, he, he just wasn't scary or intimidating or had no purpose or anything. So, and the story in my opinion was, was a bit weak, so really, um, I I give four four Dark World about uh, seven out of ten, if that's fair. For me, um, it's like you said, uh, Malekith was just not a great villain to me. It was kind of like the stereotypical, like I'm evil elf, I do this because I'm evil elf, and um, the the plot was rather confusing to me. You're right, and. I originally didn't really want to see this movie because after seeing Thor and being not that impressed by it, seeing him again, I had my doubts. So again, my doubts were confirmed because uh, the Thor of the Dark World was rather weak in my opinion because I couldn't, because Jane Foster, even though she was good in the first film, seeing her again, it was just not, I don't know, I felt little empathy for saying like oh they're back together okay she yeah. was she was very annoying in my opinion mm. and it's and all this thing about like oh she can't do this she's not from this land I'm like oh boy I haven't seen that one that kind of concept before so weak just confusing plot poor potential but at least the acting is still there so I would say I would give it a 6.5 out of 10. Fair enough. Because I've only seen it once and it's pretty forgettable, unfortunately. So, what's the next? What's next on the list? So, moving on to the ninth installment of the MCU. So, released in March 2014, Captain America himself returned for his second, for, for again, his, his second solo outing in, in what I think is possibly one, one of the best Marvel films ever made. Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Mm. Now, oh my God! So, I, I, I remember going to see this film with my two mates, Josh and Jareth, when it, when it first came out. And, and well, might I say, after watching it, I was blown away because because literally, Anthony and Joe Russo were just would were, were just the, the perfect choice to 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 direct the film. And well, so. In the Winter Soldier, it, it picks up two years after the events of the Battle of New York, and Captain America has 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 been working for a Shield in in Washington during during that time. But but however, when when him when him and Black Widow uncover a conspiracy within Shield, they join forces. With a new ally, Sam Wilson, aka the Falcon, who is who is brilliantly played by Anthony Mackie, they encounter the, the, the mysterious assassin known as the Winter Soldier, who who we find out is 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 is, is of course Bucky Barnes, who who was thought to be the deceased in back in the first Avenger. Mm -hmm. Now, what I really liked about this film was I, I, I liked how it combined multiple genres into one film. So, it was definitely like a conspiracy action thriller in, in my mind. Whereas the previous films had been like, I don't know, sci-fi or fantasy. Yeah. This felt really, really different. It felt like a, it felt like a gritty action thriller with a with a conspiracy theme mixed into the mix. It was just definitely one of Marvel's finest films to have been released. And and the way they re, they, they 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 reintroduced Bucky as the Winter Soldier, they gave it. They gave a perfect explanation as to why he became the Winter Soldier, how how he was how how he, he was he was he was he was he was rescued by Hydra and Doctor Solar and uh, well Robert and Robert Redford was was just was as brilliant as Alexander uh, uh, Pierce as always and 
And I think another thing that made this film one of the strongest films of the MCU was the fact that it was a, it was a massive game changer. The fact that Shield got, got destroyed, he really it, it, it really changed changed things up slightly, and we and we're left at the end in the film not knowing what the future had had store for Shield. So, in my opinion, I would give this film ten a solid ten out of ten because, like I said, brilliant acting, brilliant storyline, strong strong villain, and. Uh, overall, def definitely one of one of the, the, the strongest installments of the MCU by far. Your opinion, Tom? Mm. So, like I said in the um, in the Captain America First Avenger film, it was um, the Winter Soldier that I first saw Captain America, and um, it, and it was because of that movie that made me want to see the first one because it it was definitely Captain America's strongest performance. They actually showed, you know, why, you know, Captain America should be taken seriously. And I think they do a really good job in showing that. Um, and the Winter Soldier is a very interesting character to me. Um, because of his conflicting ideals and, well, no. His conflicting, you know, agent persona kind of thing. Because he was brainwashed into thinking, you know, into thinking, oh, he's this Russian, you know, assassin. When really, he's Bucky Barnes. And it's interesting to me because that's the main, you know, antagonist of the whole thing. It was this, you know, conflicting battle between Steve's best friends. So it was a hard decision for Captain America to deal with. And, you know, that his best friend was now this, you know, Russian assassin that barely remembers him. And it was tragic in some way seeing that, you know, done to him. But again, like I said... Um, it's it's really brilliant in my opinion. However, um, again, Hydra comes into the mix and instantly I don't care because, like I said before, Hydra are not that interesting one bit because they're just a they're just the Nazis. That's all I can say. Nazis, you already know what's with them, so. It's a bit... Mm, so what can I say? Um... But... Um, also, I suppose, um... It was a bit unfortunate for me, because... Since Winter Soldier is the first Captain America film I saw... It wasn't that shocking to me when Bucky Barnes was revealed to be the Winter Soldier. Because, like I said, um... Since I've seen it... I, um, I kind of, you know, didn't really know who he was, so when he revealed his identity, I was like, who is that? So, it wasn't that big of a shock to me, but I guess that's what happens when you see the second film, when you should have been seeing the first film. So, it didn't really have that much of a big impact on me, so it's a bit unfortunate that happened. But overall, I would definitely say I would give it a 9 out of 10, because... You know, it was one of the strongest, you know, one of those strong Marvel movies. They had great characters, great plot, great, you know, antagonists, everything. It was just unfortunate that Hydra was in the mix, so I already, like, Mugh. And the Winter Soldier's identity, I really didn't know, so it was kind of a bit of a, Mugh. So it was a bit of a downfall for me. Like, I wouldn't really say it's a negative thing about the movie. It's my personal fault for not seeing the first movie when really I should have seen the first movie to, to become more like a shocker to me. But I will say that the Winter Soldier is a very interesting kind of thing, um, because that's why I like, that's one of the reasons why I like the Red Hood, who is sort of like the Winter Soldier in the DC Universe. Except he's not really brainwashed or anything, but it's that, you know, kind of like, you know, the once companion of this hero, now turned into this, like, villain anti-hero kind of thing, so it makes it difficult for the hero to fight. So, yeah, just a 9 out of 10 for me. Okay, so that wraps up Camps America Winter Soldier. So, on to the 10th installment of the MCU. So, in in July 2014, well, o o August actually. Now, this is where, this is where Marvel really sw switch, switch things up and, and, and introduce us to some, some new characters who, who are, let's say, not, not around here. And oh yes, we're introduced to the Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, Guardians of the Galaxy was, well, well I, 
I never heard of Guardians of the Galaxy until the, until the film was uh, coming out. So up to a point, I was like, "Hey, what? Who are they, the Guardians of the Galaxy?" So I went to see it with my with my mates during the, during the holidays and um, during some holidays. And um, I just finished my GCSEs at this point, so I, I went down to see them World one day in August. I went to watch it with them, and well, what can I say? I loved it, honestly. Honestly, it, 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 it was fresh and it was different from the other films that had come before. Especially, it, it, especially the music used in the, used in the film. It was, it was a mixture of recognizable music and unknown music from like the, the 60s and 70s and even the 80s. And, and wow, the acting from Chris Pratt, Zoe, Zoe Saldana, Dave, Dave uh, Bustia, Vin Diesel and Bradley Cooper was just oh my god fantastic and well so yeah in Guardians of the Galaxy Peter Quill who who is known as Star Lord he forms an an uneasy alliance with a group of extra extraterrestrial misfits who who are fleeing of who are fleeing from from the galaxy are stealing a powerful artifact known as the Orb which again is an Infinity Stone which now in the film what's interesting is we. We we want we, we once again meet Thanos, who makes who makes a cameo appearance in the film, and this does, yeah. and this and, and this does ultimately have a have have quite let's say, an important link towards Avengers: Infinity War because you know he's coming, and you know I, I you know that the, we're getting one step closer to seeing Thanos yeah. in action. I'll be back in a second. I'm just gonna open a window because it, it is a bit hot in here. Sure, yeah. Kind <laughs> of talking. Sure. I mean. I mean, what struck me was the the, the fact that it, it was so successful at the box office, grossing over seven hundred seventy three mi- seven hundred seventy three point point three million dollars at the box office worldwide, and the fact that the critics just literally raved about it. And like the Avengers, everyone everyone went went to see it. That they, they they wanted to see it. And I think what what was good was the fact that Marvel were able to introduce. Some new characters to the franchise, and really, wow, I was just impressed with with the film. Really, the acting and the music and the storyline, and and of course, Ronin was, I think, I think a really good villain. Or, 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 although he didn't have much of a much of a backstory, which, which was a bit disappointing in my mind, um, he was still quite. Quite, quite a good villain because obviously he was working for Thanos, and um, I mean, I, I, I also in, introduced to Gamara and Nibbler, who, 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 who too adopted also Thanos, who, who Gamara joins the uh, Guardians eventually. I think it was like a, it was kind of like a musical in some ways because of the music it featured, but really in my, in my mind, just a. Just a just a brilliant move for for, for, for Marvel to in, to in, to introduce new characters to to the franchise and um, and I think definitely yeah just for me nine out of ten from from me so yeah that's what I think about Guardians of the Galaxy and what are you Tom what were your thoughts on it all right so um I didn't see Guardians of the Galaxy when it first came out um it was only last year that I saw Guardians of the Galaxy because um, by this point I suppose um, I was sort of going off you know Marvel movies because it it was hard for me to gain any kind of interest in seeing like a Marvel superhero movie because um, I suppose it was kind of like the same kind of concept to me you know villain hero kind of thing so I didn't see it originally but um, so when I recently saw it, um, I was definitely impressed by it. Um, I love the fact that Marvel somehow managed to get these characters that were not that quite well known, and somehow making a movie about them boosted their in you know significance in the whole Marvel universe. So it definitely shows that you know Marvel can bring back char- can bring characters that are not well known by the public, and show you know how important they are to the whole Marvel universe. Um, there's not much to say about it, I would say, because, 
you know, I loved the soundtrack. The soundtrack was very, you know, classic 80s kind of thing, so I loved the fact that they did that. Star-Lord was a definite, was a very funny character, in my opinion, the way he did his cheesy moves and everything. So I loved that. Um, however, when it comes to it, when it comes to the team building, I thought it was a bit rushed, in my opinion. Because it was only very, it was a very short time, and then, like, I think it was, like, near the beginning of the movie, when it comes to the prison scene, they're just like, oh, we're together now. It's kind of just like, well, I don't know if, to me, it felt a bit rushed, building the team. But it's it's not that big, well, it's it's not that big of a deal, I suppose, because, you know, what can you do? Um, but I, w I would have liked it if there was more time given to the team to be developed instead of just like, you know, instant. Because that was my, because that's what I liked about the Avengers so much, that it took time to build the Avengers. Because each of the characters had their own differences, like they had personal vendettas against each other. Steve Rogers one was not really particularly fond of Iron Man because of his, you know, technology kind of thing. Um, and Thor were, and, you know, Mark Hamill, no, or just... Bruce Banner was not particularly fond of anybody because he was afraid that they would just use him for his, you know, power. So, when it comes to Guardians of the Galaxy, it, it was a bit rushed with the team making. It was kind of just like, boom, done, done. You know, not really any kind of personal vendettas against anyone. It was kind of just like, oh, you just want to do this. I just want to do that. Okay, let's just do this. So, it's not that big of a deal in my opinion and again the villain is not that interesting at all it's kind of just like oh he's a Thanos henchman what else is there but I was definitely interested to see you know th um, Thanos you know show his authority you know to show you know a potential of how dangerous he can become and also fun fact that Nibula was Cameron Gillen I actually wasn't aware of that for a very long time until I was again recently notified after seeing the film I was like oh that's pretty good so, that's a huge plus in my opinion. So, I would give this film about a 8 out of 10. Great story, everything. Just, for me, it was rushed development and, you know, not that great of a villain. And my pug is deciding to join us. Hello, oh. Mimi. Hello, Mimi. Do you want to come up? Okay. Say hello. Hello, Mimi. Do you want to say, do you want to say hello to the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it, but it's a pug. Hello, okay. puglet. Okay, so that's Guardians of the Galaxy um, for you. So, moving on to the 11th installment of the MCU. Well, the penultimate film of Phase 2, which in, which in May 2015, the Avengers reassembled for, for, for another outing in Avengers Age of Ultron. Now, now this film takes place one year after the events of Captain America The Winter Soldier. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in between the events of that film, the event, the Avengers have um, have been have been have uh, have uh, come up, come out together in, in order to in order to take down several Hydra bases located across the globe, in the hope of in in the hope of locating Loki's scepter and, and getting them back. So they so they so they get back, but however. However, Tony Stark and Bruce Banner mess with artificial intelligence and create a program called Ultron. Now, now bearing in mind that Tony Stark's a genius, right? It was it was out of his it was out of, out of his and Bruce Banner's control essentially because well, it backfired and uh, and it created a, a, a big a, 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 a big metal monster really who stole who stole who stole a scepter and took it. And to, uh, and took the gem out of the scepter, which is another Infinity Stone, and that, and that, and that's the Mind Stone, which was which was in integrated into into the newest member of, of the Avengers, which was Vision. Now, Age of Ultron. Now, I love the first Avengers, as I said. So we knew right from the beginning that um, Age of Ultron would have a hard act to follow, didn't we, Tom? Yeah. Now. Age of Ultron. I thought it was a it was a, it was a pretty good film, but it was nowhere near as good as good good, good as the first one in, in my opinion. Mm. I mean, I mean the acting was good and the chemistry between between the team was spot on as always, but 
Ultron, whilst I whilst I love James Spader, and as much as I enjoyed his performance in um, Boston Legal, I was quite excited to see him as Ultron, but um, although he was not, not a bad villain, he was he was fairly weak in some areas, which you might agree with me on that, Tom. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he didn't quite live up to like Loki or um, or the Winter Soldier for for, for, that, for that matter. Mm. And what was interesting was he, he was filmed in different countries this time. I, I suppose the first film, so it's filmed in England, Korea, Italy, yeah, New York. They have more of a um, you know range of countries to film from. So yeah, it gave a, the film a different texture, and ironically enough. They filmed part of it in the Asher Valley in, in Italy, and when I've been on my uh, road trip to Italy before, I've driven past the uh, building where they and the town where they filmed some of some some the uh, the final battle for Sokovia. Mm. Now, what's interesting about this film is in in the scene where Steve Rogers and Tony Stark have a brief feud, it it, it kind of foreshadowed civil war because. Because as you because as you may have seen in the first Avengers film, which we didn't mention this earlier, you you can see that like, like Stark and Rogers had a little grudge towards each other. Like like there was more to 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 the to the dynamic between them than meets the eye. Yeah, and that became more more clearer in the second film because because their difference of of opinion. So when they had that mini feud whilst they were trying to decide how to how to sort out vision, mm. it, it it's like you knew that um. Civil War was coming. You knew it. You, you knew that, that their uh, their big fight was was going to happen eventually. And mm. whilst it, and whilst it was great to see all all the Avengers back together, and and, and of course having Scarlet Witch and uh, Quicksilver introduced, as well as the, as, as well as the Vision, it was also, it was also great to see the Falcon and uh, War Machine also featured as well. Yeah, and. And what made the ending good was the fact that it it's hard to hint that the roster would be evolving. So, 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 so obviously bringing in Scarlet Witch and Vision and War Machine and, and the Falcon as the new Avengers, I was like Captain Black Widow. I think that was a good move. Because because Dev Dev showed it to while Stark for Hulk and Hawkeye had um, had had uh, had moved on. It it it, it, it showed it to there were new fresh faces ready to join the Avengers. Yeah. And to and essentially carry on what the original loss started. Mm. So, overall, I would give Avengers Assemb- Avengers Age of Ultron. Sorry, <laughs> um, I give it eight point five out of ten, which is uh, which is, I I think a fully fair rating. W- w- would you agree? Um, I, I guess yeah. Um, when it comes to Age of Ultron, um, it was a bit of a. It, it, again, it didn't really live up to, like, you know, the first film as many of these, you know, no. sequel films have. No, even though it grossed um, one, just over $1.4 billion at the box yeah. office, which was a little less than Avengers Assembled. Um, it has all the th- all the parts that made the Avengers good. The, um, you know, the team-ups and uh, the jokes and, you know, the, the hero feuds between the characters... And um, that's the really interesting part to me in in um, Age of Ultron that they explored more on the characters, you know, feuds towards each other. So it hinted towards civil war. So that that's a really good part I did like that's about funny. it. Um, however, um, also it was interesting to see you know new superpowered villains such as Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, and they actually have a proper reason for hating the Avengers because. They were infect. They were affected by the the power of the Avengers. And then an Ultron, obviously. Um, yeah, feuded did their desires, and it was in. And I liked Quicksilver in the Age of Ultron and Scarlet Witch because, um, they hated Tony Stark because of what they did, and they hence the reason they wanted to be, you know, experimented on by Hydra with the Tesseract. Was it with the Tesseract that got their powers from? No, no, the Scepter. Yeah, that. that Got their powers from the scepter because they wanted to have a chance of hitting back. But then, but then when they found out like uh, like Ultron's true intentions, they switched um, sides. And they knew that the and they knew that the Avengers needed needed, needed their help in order to uh, take down Ultron. Mm. Now, um, I know it seems like you know I want to get to the bad. Parts of what it, you know, the Avengers like Ultron, but I will say this now. 
I could go on hours and hours and hours and hours and hours about, like, you know, what I liked about the Avengers Age of Ultron. But, you know, I want to, you know, move on with the list and keep on talking about other films we've seen. So, um, I would say the reason why it falls back is because it's villain Ultron. I wouldn't say he's a bad villain at all. I would say he's an alright villain. Because it was kind of stereotypical that, like, oh, we've created this AI system that thinks for its own self. It kind of always sets up what's going to happen. Because, um... And you could say that, like, oh, you know, this... Whenever a movie does that, that must be bad. No, it doesn't. I, Robot... I'll give you an example. I, Robot is one of my favourite films ever. It's one of my favourite films. I constantly see it. I always take my time to watch it. The reason why I like it so much is because, um, this AI system has to obey to the law of robotics. You know, don't harm a human, blah, blah, blah. But the reason why um, this AI system named Vicky wants to kill these humans is because she saw what they did, you know, and everything. And she was like, how could this happen and everything? And you could say that's the same with Voltron, but it, but unfortunately, that's the biggest thing. They're two different genres. iRobot is about a thriller kind of suspicion kind of thing where, where you in, where it investigates, okay, so who's responsible for this or whatever. With Age of Ultron, you they had to cut it short. So it was kind of just like, Age of Ultron, create this AI system, oh, guess what, he's evil. Hobbity doobity da. And, um, one of my biggest, you know, disagreement. Also, when it comes to, um, you know, confusing plots, is it just me or just the Black Widow and the Hulk, you know, romance was odd? Yeah, I didn't get that at all, yeah. to be honest. In the first film, it wasn't really hinted at or anything. It was just normal. So in the second film, it was hinted, and it was kind of just like, what's the point? You know, why are they suddenly falling in love? You know, why are they doing this? This, You know, it doesn't really give a proper explanation. They could just say, oh, guess what? We're monsters because this and this. But I'm like, no, there's a big difference between being trained to kill someone or also being a big, green, raging monster that can easily snap you in two just because he just stopped his toe on the coffee table. So, it was a bit unnecessary. The romance was completely unnecessary, right, in my I opinion. Agree. If he took the romance out of the film, it wouldn't affect the film at all. So, and then, unfortunately, my biggest contrib of the film, the death of Quicksilver. It's sad to me. It's, a, it's unfortunate because I liked Quicksilver in you this did. film because if he survived, he would have had an interesting kind of concept you know, in Civil War, you know, would he stick with his sister to, you know, with Team America, Captain America, or does he want to go with Team Iron Man? But it most likely he would go with his sister, obviously. And it, and it, I like the effects they did for him, having a super speedster and everything. It was just unfortunate that the actor died, the, not the actor, the actor didn't die. Um, it was unfortunate that the character was killed because originally in the script, he was going to live. But for some strange reason, they just changed it to kill him off. So it was unfortunate that the ha ha that had to happen. And it was kind of contradicting a few points because if Quicksilver can somehow, you know, know where the bullet is coming from and easily move out of the way, he surely must know where the bullets are coming from a machine gun and he could just move around it to get Hawkeye and the kid out of there instead of pulling himself in front of the fire. Mm. So, it's, it, again, it was just a bit stupid, but people would say, oh, the machine gun towing could fire faster than the thing. You, you're just like, if a fan has to say that, and the movie's not saying that, that's, that doesn't mean it's acceptable. That still looks like, to me, poor lazy writing of saying how to kill off a character. So, he, I think Quicksilver d didn't really give, didn't give as much justice to his death. His death was kind of unnecessary. Exactly. But... You could, I would say it's a bit of a mix because it is a bit necessary to to show Scarlet Witch's you know power because essentially in the comics she's the most powerful mutant she can warp reality so I don't know if they're gonna do it for the MCU but it was a bit sad that you know Quicksilver didn't really give that much of a chance to you know carry on as a superhero but. In overall conclusion, I would give it um, a, a an 8 out of 10. Because, like I said, great everything, blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, 
villain, okay. Okay, unnecessary romance and the death of Quicksilver. So, hmm. So, what's next on the list? Okay, so moving on to the con con uh, concluding film of Phase 2 and the 12th film of the MCU. Uh, well, Marvel in introduced yet the, the, newest the newest member, the newest member of the Avengers, which was Ant-Man. Now, what can I say? Ant-Man, well, I wasn't too sure about the concept at first of of superhero who can shrink to the size of an atom, hmm. but when I went to see it in Cornwall with my with my family and my and my cousin, oh my god, I I really enjoyed it because 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 I think personally, Ant Man was a was a brilliant film in my mind. I mean, I mean, I mean, it, it was like a comedy heist in my opinion. Whereas I, whereas like there there was like um. I don't know, sci-fi, fantasy, conspiracy, thriller, orientated films. I like how Peyton Reed, the director, came out, wrote wrote down Ant Man as like a as like a um, comedy heist. Mm. That's what I thought. And and well, and it was, and it was good to see how how Stark and their uh, Peyton Carter made cameo appearances in the in the flash scene to Shield in 1989. Mm. And well. So, in Ant Man, it, it takes place six months after the events of Age of Ultron, and Scott Lang, who who who's a who's a petty criminal, has been has been released from from prison and is trying to to re, to, to rebuild his life. But, but however, when he gets involved with um, Doctor Hank Pym and his, and his daughter Hope, well, he he acquires this mysterious suit known as known as the Ant Man te technology. The, the, for, for can shrink in size, he be he he be, he becomes the vigilante known as Ant Man, and and it, and it, uh, and it, and is mentored by by Hank and Hope in order to um, take down Darren Cross, who is known as the Yellow Jacket. Hmm. Now, what can I say about Ant Man? What I liked was it was very different to the other MCU films that f f f f f come before it because. It, it didn't sort of focus on like all, on on all the fighting and that. It, it, it focused more more on the humor and the and the kind of uh, and, and the kind of lightheartedness of, of Scott Lang. Yeah. He really showed he re he really showed that even though he was a criminal, there was there was a there was there was a good side to him. The the, the fact that he he wanted to become a superhero eventually and 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 protect, and protect his daughter. The person who he probably loved the most out of, mm. out of, out of everyone he knew, and and, and I will and I will admit, um, the the yellow jacket was a, a pretty good villain. Even though I mean, yeah, even though he had no backstory whatsoever, I thought he was a. I thought Darren Cross was was a really good villain, and the the yellow jacket was just well portrayed in my mind, mm. and. And 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 it was just generally funny. I really laughed for a throughout for the whole thing. Literally, the humour was just fantastic, and I, I and I just couldn't stop laughing throughout the whole thing. It was just so funny and just so entertaining and engaging for the audience. So, so for those reasons, I'd say I'd say Ant Man was definitely one of one of the funniest and probably probably one of one of the stronger MCU films. And I think I'd give it a solid nine out of ten, in my opinion, because well, Ant Man definitely has has the potential to 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 go on to to, to be an Avenger in the future. Yeah. So, um, Tom, what did you think of Ant Man? So I'm going to start this off with um, with uh, saying that um, I actually like this movie, and um, again, Marvel hits the classic like you know, even though Ant Man was actually an Avenger in the oh excuse me in the first Avengers comic. So he was an actual Avenger before the films. Um, it's interesting, again, it's interesting to see, you know, Marvel bring up a character that was a part of the Avengers and is just not really well recognized and bringing a silly concept as shrinking to the size of an ant and commanding an army of ants. It's kind of just like, well, how is that going to make a movie? 
again, Marvel show that, you know, they can make, you know, something out of exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. They can, you know, show that even a, a hero that is not well known, like Guardians of the Galaxy, to be something special. So it's the same with Ant Man, uh, with a ridiculous kind of power, but it show again, they somehow make it into a, you know, a meaningful movie that ties in with the Marvel Universe. What's really interesting to me is that um, I don't know that much of, of Ant Man. So when I first saw it, I was like, oh, okay. So when I actually read about Ant Man, I was like, oh, that's really interesting the way they've done it because. Funny enough, Ant-Man is a bit more darker in the comics because Hank Pym is the Ant-Man in the comics and is the Ant later becomes Yellow Jacket. Mm. Um, but in the comics, he also abused his wife, like actual domestic abuse, I and actually tried to kill his friends when he actually lost it. So I can get it why, you know, they didn't want to do that. And he also created crazy Ultron in the comics. Yeah, so... He was a bit of a disastrous character, so luckily they made him a really likable character in the movie. They did. So they switched him with a different kind of character called Scott Ham, which I actually like. And again, they do justice to that. They managed to create a character that, you know, he doesn't come from like, you know, a hero backstory, like, oh, he's the good kid or whatever. He's an actual criminal, but he's he has a soft side to him. And that's an interesting kind of character that I like. You know, he's a criminal, but he later becomes the hero. So, so with this movie, they've um, they've done justice with that. You know, they've kind of broke the mold a bit. But I know that other movies have done this, obviously. But in in speaking in Marvel terms, they broke the mold for this in the movie universe. You know, instead of showing a character that's come from like you know they didn't do anything wrong in their life, blah blah blah. With Hank, with not Hank Pym, with Scott, he actually is a criminal. So he, so then later he becomes the hero, and again the humor is done really well, and I do enjoy that, and I like the design of his outfit as well. Me like, too. Yeah, a very funny. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, when it comes to the villain, again it falls on the same kind of you know trope that Marvel can't do good villains. What well, not? I would say they can't do good villain backstories because most of their audience is young children who see the movies and just like oh it's the best film ever you know blah 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 but if you're actually thinking from it from an actual critical point of view it's not that great of a villain even though the, the suit is great and everything it was kind of a rip off of um, Iron Man's villain in the first film Iron Monger and you know Justin Hammer you know they just want the same technology that Hank Pym did and then yeah, they're just villains because they are villains. You know, what else can I say? It's not that interesting, so... Again, what can I say? So, for this reason, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Because, you know, it has all these great elements and everything. It's just a shame that it... It still struck... It came up... It became another victim of the, mar of the typical, you know, Marvel can't do a good villain backstory kind of thing. So, uh, the next film. Okay. Okay, so. <coughs> so, moving, oh. so, moving into the. Um, <coughs> you alright? Yeah, it's just the Desmono. Oh. Smells bit. Yep. So, okay. Now. Okay, so moving into phase three now. Okay, so now this is what at the point where. I have seen some of the movies from Phase 3, but I haven't seen all of them. So, don't expect me to, you know, sort of like know each movie because at this point, you know, I'm either interested in seeing it or I'm not really interested by seeing it. Okay, so, so, it, so in May 2016, Phase 3 of the MCU kicked off with, with, uh, with the Captain America Civil War, Steve Rogers' third solo outing. And the final chapter of the trilogy. <laughs> so, um, so, so in Civil War, it it picks up one year after the events of Avengers: Age of Ultron, and Captain America and the new team of of of, of Avengers continue their efforts to, to safeguard humanity from all the from all the dead, deadly threats that they'll, they'll await them. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's. 
So, so whilst on mission in Lagos in, Ni in, in Nigeria, when tracking down F Frank Gurul, who's the who who was uh, who, who who's now Crossbones and was and was the and was secretly the, the Hydra agent back in the Winter Soldier, he he, he tries to kill himself, but um, but whilst trying to deal with them, another another in in, yet another international incident occurs. Therefore, the the Therefore, the, the, the United Nations can't tolerate it anymore because. So, uh, basically, when um, when the when the when when the Sokovia Accords are brought in, saying that the Avengers will operate under under government control, Steve Rogers is against it, but Tony Stark is for it. So when the Avengers can't can't disagree can't agree on what's best, they essentially become divided. So one half led by Led by Steve Rogers and who have led by Tony Stark, but but there's more to the story than meets the eye. It's not what you think. The main reason why the Avengers become divided is because Z Helmer Zemo, who who is who, who's essentially the main antagonist in the film, his family w were killed during the during, during the Battle of Sokovia. So so Zemo really wanted wanted to get revenge on the Avengers. By therefore tearing them apart, therefore, the, the, therefore the reason why he wanted he wanted revenge on the Avengers, which is why I thought he was a pretty good villain because he, he had a reason for wanting to tear the Avengers apart, because because they because they unknowingly killed his family in Sokovia, without knowing. So, what I thought was good about this film is that it, it, it handled the theme of politics and um, and. I, I, I'm going to oversight very well, like it, like you knew, like like knew so 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 bad was what was going to happen. But it was in this film where we were introduced to uh, to uh, Black Panther, of course. Yeah. Of certain movie, and we were we were introduced to the new Spider-Man, as 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 portrayed by Tom Holland. Now, now this was the first film to feature Tom Holland as Spider-Man. Following. Following the uh, following the, the departure of Andrew Garfield from the Amazing Spider-Man films, because fo fo because following following the, the the failure of the Amazing Spider-Man two at the box office, all sequels and spin-offs were cancelled, and therefore Sony and the uh, Sony and Marvel Studios struck a deal to allow Spider-Man to appear in the MCU, and Tom Holland was cast to replace Garfield in the role of Peter Parker. Now. Now I loved Tom Holland and Chadwick Boseman as Spider-Man and Black Panther in this film because it was it was absolutely brilliant to bring in two new characters into the film because because whilst the Avengers were fighting each other, well Black Panther didn't really pick a side because he was like he he was like a third party. Well, no, he, he did actually pick a side. He was more he was with Stark. Yeah, but he was kind of like sort, but he sort of leaned more towards Cap later on. Mm. Because I think he was he was he was he was kind of conned into thinking, you know, you know, you know, yeah, that to start was right, and Rogers was wrong. Yeah. But but Spider-Man, but Peter Parker, obviously, he was he was he was uh, lured in by uh, by Tony Stark into into the conflict. But but the, but, but the good thing was, I liked how Tony Stark kind of like served as a mentor to Peter Parker, mm. which I think it was nice to, to to see that to see, see that relationship kind of. Developed during the film, yeah, and we would obviously see more of it in 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 Homecoming, but but, but obviously more on that later. Mm. Um, but what I loved about Civil War was the fact that it raised the stakes for the Avengers, and and the story was brilliant, and Zemo was actually surprisingly quite quite a good villain, if that's fair enough. Uh, yeah, I was say, yeah, and well, and it and it and it essentially set. Set the stage for 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 Infinity War, so it, so so once again, like Iron Man three, this film essentially de de deconstructed Captain America, because because saw the, the the Avengers being torn apart, Bucky finally getting back getting getting his senses back, and, and, and of course Steve Rogers letting go of that shield in the film, therefore le le letting go of the Captain America identity. That was him being deconstructed again. So he went from being a rah rah company man uh, during the first film to being essentially an, an insurgent by 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 by, by, by the end of the third film. 
mm. I'm more or less a fugitive well for Team Cat really they're, 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 they all became fugitives by the end of the film yeah so really I think it'll be interesting coming to come Infinity War to see what what's happened to, to, to those characters since since then but overall I think Civil War w- was definitely one of one of again one of one of one of the strongest MCU films to date whilst it may not have quite a lift up to, to, to the Winter Soldier it, it, it was definitely a strong film and I'd give it a, 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 I'd definitely give it a solid 9.5 out of 10 from me so um, Tom what, what are your thoughts on Civil War alright so um, I recently um, saw um, Batman vs Superman in the cinemas and I and you can imagine I'm with the crowd I was disappointed by it so, so was when I. I saw another movie doing a superhero versus superhero kind of thing um, done by Marvel I hoped that they did a better job and they did not disappoint me um, this actually had a really good reason why Captain America and Iron Man should be fighting um, and then, and like you said it's a great idea it's a great like you know kind of polit- political kind of thing where it actually makes the audience question about it because with Captain with this whole agreement that you know superheroes shouldn't come until we actually actually need them um, with Captain America saying it'd be better if we just came here as soon as possible because then we save more lives whilst Tony Stark says no because then otherwise we're putting more people in danger and they actually show why Tony Stark thinks that because hmm. He is reminded again of, you know, the creation of Quicksilver and, you know, the Scarlet Witch was because of his bombs. Hmm. Um, and a woman came up to him during a conference saying, you know, that, you know, this happened to my daughter and it was all your fault. His son, her son actually. Oh, her son, sorry. Yeah. And again, that made him feel guilty for his actions. And that's the interesting thing about Tony Stark is that he is constantly haunted by his actions yeah. of what he's doing. So... Hence the reason he supports this whole like you know yeah. you know we should only come when we need to. And whilst um, and if I may um, but in yeah go ahead. Um, while while Lights by was why whilst previous films like for instance the Avengers, Fall of the Dark World, Captain America: The Winter Soldier, and Avengers: Age of Ultron dealt with like world-ending experiences, I think this was the right time to you know tell a story of you know what's what's the public's re- reaction to this you know you know has it gone on for, for, for long enough and really like I said questions questions the audience is it sh- is it really time for the f- for the avengers you know come under government control and should and should they really be a, a, a private organ- organization mm-hmm. you really kind of m- makes you question that in my mind yeah so I was pleasant to see that you know um, reoccurring heroes coming back like Ant Man. Ant Man made an appearance, so that was wonderful. Oh, I'm Hawkeye, uh, War Machine, and every like hero that and we Spider-Man. know, as well as making two new appearances, Spider Man um, and Black, Black Panther. Panther, which both did really good in my opinion. But however, when it comes to Spider Man, I'm a bit mixed about that because um because the way I see it is because I grew up watching you know. Loads of Spider-Man things. I've watched the Spider-Man animated series. I've played the Spider-Man games. I've watched the films. So t- I always, t- t- yeah. T- 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 so series. I always see Aunt May as this old woman who's wise. Hence the reason Peter cares for her. So to see a younger version of May is a bit off to me because I don't really see Aunt May as that figure and Tony constantly hitting on her. I don't really feel that comfortable with that. No. So. It's a bit off for me. But um, with Tom Holland, I'm not quite sure. He does a good role. His acting is superb, obviously. But uh, again, I just do not see Spider-Man as that young of an age. But, you know, what can, what can I say? Hmm. He so, also became the fourth MCU film to, to gross out $1 billion at the box office. Well, Civil War, Homecoming. Civil War. Civil has War, it, obviously. Yeah. Has it made, has it made just, just over $1.1 billion yeah. at, at the box office. So, so back to the point. Um, again, it's in... And they've actually managed to do the iconic scene in the end where Captain America was pulling up his shield whilst Iron Man is firing his two lasers at the shield. So it, it, they do that re, you know, iconic image, which is really great. And 
unlike Batman vs Superman, um, where like they do the typical stereo trope of every like you know hero versus hero kind of thing, where um, they where like oh what do you know we actually have a common enemy you know kind of thing. In this one, they actually stick to the you know what the title is because they have another reason to fight again. Because in the end, it turns out that that you know the Winter Soldier was actually responsible for, you know, Iron Man's parents' death, which makes him, you know, go to Steve and says, why do you side with the person who has killed my family? And you actually know this. And Zemo obviously staged this whole thing. And exactly. even though Zemo had a, um, it has a reason to hate the Avengers, unfortunately, he's not given as much of the spotlight because we're too distracted by, like, the whole superhero versus superhero kind of ideal. So... That's the unfortunate thing with Civil War, I would say. Because we're too distracted by this. We're not given enough time to look at Zemo as a as a proper, you know, character. But I do like it that like they've managed to create a reason to why they're fighting. So the first reason was because of the document, then the second reason was because, you know, Iron Man was revealed the truth to him that, you know, that Steve is actually siding with the person who killed his family. So I actually like that. Now, unfortunately, my biggest control with the thing is that the title doesn't really make sense. Because I don't know why it's called Captain America Civil War, because technically it's not really about Captain America. It's it was Avengers. about the whole Avengers, so technically it should be called Avengers Civil War. But according to the directors, they say, oh no, it focuses on Captain America. You're like, no, it doesn't. It just focuses on the others as well. There's Tony. St it focuses on a fair share of Tony Stark and Captain America, so it doesn't really feel like a Captain America film. It just feels like an Avengers film. So if it should be called Avengers 2.5, or just that's what I thought. Yeah, so Avengers Civil War. Hence the reason um, in the comic book Civil War, it was called Civil War. It wasn't called Captain America Civil War because it also focused on loads and loads and loads and loads of Marvel characters. But obviously, since this is the movies, you have to have a budget. So. That's my only contrib that's my only two well, sort of contrives to the movie. Spider Man portrayal, not quite sure, but still found it enjoyable. The Xeno thing, they do have a potential for Xeno, but unfortunately we were too distracted by the superhero versus superhero kind of thing. And the the title isn't shouldn't really be called that. But oh but because of that, um I wouldn't say I would say that I would give this movie a nine point five out of ten. Because, like I said, they, they do a way better job than Batman vs. Superman. They stick to why Civil War is Civil War. And they actually bring up a, a good message to you after the movie that makes you, you know, keep, keep questioning the motivations of the characters and everything. So, um, yeah, on to the next movie. So, moving on to the 14 installments of the MCU. So, in, in, the, in November 2016, we were introduced to... Yet another one of our new characters from the comics, um, and that was Doctor Strange. Okay, so now unfortunately, unfortunately, I have not seen this movie. Oh, so so, so um, down to me then. Because unfortunately, I can't give any opinions on this because I keep telling myself I need to see it, but when you grow up, you have loads and loads of things to do, so you never really get the chance to see it and anything. So. I'm just going to leave it to Elliot to give his opinions on the movie, and then okay. we move on to the next. So, my apologies. Okay. So, Doctor Strange, he he's portrayed by by course, the man behind Sherlock, Ben Cumberbatch, mm -hmm. one of one of one of the most brilliant British actors of our time. Had of course stars Rachel Rachel McAdams and Tilda Swinton, and well, so what, so what can I say about Doctor Strange? Well. So in Doctor Strange, we're introduced to to, to Stephen Strange, who is a, a neuro who is a neurosurgeon in in Manhattan, and um, and following an accident, and following a um, car accident, which which potentially could could have ended his career, he sets out on on a mission to uh, find the, the the ancient one to help heal heal himself, and then. And then by doing so, he learns all these magical and new mystical arts, really, R really, and and that's when he becomes Doctor Strange, essentially. And well, I will admit, like Guardians of the Galaxy and Ant Man, 
I think it was once again brilliant how how Marvel w- 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 were able to introduce a, a fairly unknown character into the into the franchise and bring him to the big screen because well he was he was absolutely fantastic. Well, Benedict Cumberbatch's performance was phenomenal as Doctor Strange because 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 I love watching him in Sherlock and well I think he was generally the right man for the part and what I think it does well is well is it, it focuses on more of the fantasy kind of mystical side of the MCU because like Wong said whereas the Avengers protect Earth from from physical threats Doctor Strange and, and of course his, uh, his allies protect, protect well, more mystical threats and we do see another Infinity Stone in it which is obviously which is obviously the time stone seen in the eye of Agamato, and um, so so that in mind there is a there is a little hint hint there is a little hint or sort of teaser towards Avengers Infinity War in that because obviously Stephen Strange will be in Infinity War obviously because he has the the time stone. But but what I loved was the fact that it, it opens up new opportunities to the MCU. So it potentially opens up the MC. The Marvel Cinematic Multiverse in the future, whereas whereas we can see alternate timelines and um, and really well, I think I think in the future uh, I think in Phase Four we could potentially see like um, the the multiverse really take shape and see alternate timelines and alternate Earths really. So, in my opinion, Doctor Strange just literally there was. The villain was really good, I think. I mean, well, even though even though he was uh, Dumanu was quite weak because we didn't really see it see him until well the very end. So so I, I think he was fairly weak in that sense because we didn't really see him until the end of the film. So so it was just oh his henchmen just them um, doing all the work for him. But overall, Doctor Strange was I think a brilliant film and just really. Realize how how focused on more on more the fantasy kind of mystical side of the MCU as well as as well as paving the way for the multiverse in the future and, and of course giving a few more hints and teasers towards Infinity Infinity War. So I give Doctor Strange, I'd say eight out of ten, which is I think a, a fair enough score. And of course it grossed over six hundred and seven point seven million dollars at the box office. So yeah, I, I thought I thought I thought I thought it was a good film, and I hope I very much hope a sequel gets made in the future. So, on to the next film. So, in twenty so in 2017, we 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 had three films last year. So so on to the 15th so on to the 15th installment of the MCU, which which last April kick started with. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. Again, another movie I have not seen because um, even though Guardians of the Galaxy was interesting for me, it wasn't really enough to make me go and see the second one because I'm sorry, I'm just not that interested in Guardians of the Galaxy, unfortunately. So I didn't really have much motivation to see the see Volume Two. So you take it from here, Elliot. Okay. So, Volume Two. Uh, firstly, I will note it, it, it was it grossed it grossed far more than the first film. It, it grossed eight hundred sixty three point eight million dollars at the box office. And uh, in terms of the timeline, it takes place much earlier in um, in 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 the, the, MC, the MCU's continuity, as it's set in in October twenty fourteen, which is about two or, two or three months after the, the, the events of the first film. So. So therefore, it, it bridges the gap between Captain America: The Winter Soldier and Avengers: Age of Ultron. So, so in the second film, the Guardians of the Galaxy are now are now are now well established as 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 heroes across the galaxy, and they continue their efforts to um, to protect those who are in danger. And and the film really explores their. For, for like new roles as Guardians, like they've got more responsibilities on them than, than they had in the first film. And, and the villain was of course Ego, who was uh, Peter Quill's father, who who we learn who we learn that um, killed Peter's mother e- eventually. 
uh, and it turns out he was the he was the bad guy. Now, the things I liked about Volume Two was well, the music was once again flawless, as you had I, I, I had quite a few fantastic tunes in it. Like for instance, Fleetwood Max, the the chain appeared in the soundtrack, and it was more diverse this time because you had a mixture of well known and very unknown songs in the in the soundtrack. So. That was really interesting to, to hear, and, and whilst there were no real links to any any of the other Phase Three films, and there was like, uh, and there was no pro, pro, and there was no links to Avengers: Infinity War because well, obviously Thanos wasn't in it because at that point it was a, it was it was it was it was about the Guardians of what they were up to at, at that stage, and and oh my God, Baby Groot was just. Oh, he was so cute. He was just—he—he he was just literally one, one of the standout parts of the film, and just so funny. Oh my word! But but but, but what was really sad was that the fact that um, Yondu sa sacrificed himself to save, save Peter. Now, I, I was really sad when he when he died because he he was truly a far figure towards Peter. And I, I, I thought the bit where where he came floating down and said, "I'm Mary Poppins, y'all." I thought that was just hilarious and one of, the, one of the best comedy jokes of the film. So, in my mind, whilst Volume Two was 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 was, was, was really enjoyable and a good film, it wasn't quite it wasn't quite quite as good as the first film because it didn't feel as fresh or as um, or, or as or as original as it um, should have done. But but nevertheless, it was it was it, it was a good film, and I personally rate it eight out of ten in my opinion. Because, well, whilst the whilst Ego wasn't exactly wasn't exactly because well, Ego was actually a, a good a good villain because he he had a backstory and we knew how he came to be and who he was and what his motivation was and we all knew it was it, it was it was a trap essentially. So yeah. Volume two definitely lived up to um, expectations, even if it wasn't as quite quite as good as the first film. So, so anyway, that's that. that that's only two. So that's now moving on to, to the sixteenth sixteenth installment of the MCU, and uh, in July and July twenty seventeen, Peter Parker returns to scene in, in in his first standalone Spider-Man film, in Spider-Man: Homecoming, mm. which. which which was the first Spider-Man film since he raised Spider-Man 2 in 2014, and and the and the and the, and the first feat, and, and the first full standalone film to feature Tom Holland as Peter Parker, and of course featured Tony Stark, and featured Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark in the film, in in a small in, in a kind of su supporting role. Now, Homecoming, the Homecoming picked up picks up about two months after the events of Civil War. Wait, hang on a sec. Isn't that what about Thor Ragnarok? Didn't that come before Homecoming? No, no, no Ragnarok comes after Homecoming. Oh, I thought it came. Oh, never mind. No. Also, um, before it continues on, sorry, this is going to be the most controversial, contra one. contradict. Well, like no, Con like contradicted. No, like. Me, yeah, you could call it contradicted opinions because I have a completely different opinion of Spider-Man: Homecoming. But I'll let Elliot, um, I'll let Elliot expo um, show his opinion towards the film, and I'll give my side of it. So carry on, Elliot. Okay. So, in Homecoming, it, it picks up two months after the the, the events of Civil War, and following Peter Parker's involvement with the Avengers during Civil War, um, he returns home to. To, to, to resume studies, studies in Midtown High School, as well as um, continuing continue to, to fight crime as Spider-Man. Now, this was this was a very different Spider-Man film compared to the uh, previous ones because because I grew up loving the um, to Tobey Tobey Maguire trilogy and, and of course the, the Andrew Garfield Amazing Spider-Man films. So yeah, see so, so what Tom Holland had. The, has certain elements of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield in them. I felt he, I felt he he brought a, he he brought a completely different take to, to the character than we than we the, 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 the we previously seen. And 
and it was interesting. I was interesting to to explore the concept of Peter Parker being high school high school because in 1960s comics, you, Peter Parker was in high school whilst in Spider Man. So I thought it was interesting to kind of bring bring a concept that they hadn't explored yet in a, a Spider Man film into into the storyline. And well, Mark Keaton. Who formerly played Batman in the in the nineteen eighty nine film by Tim Burton, mm-hmm. of course played played the Vulture. Who, well, now the Vulture was originally going to play by John Malkovich in Spider Man Four with Tobey Maguire. Had it had it, had it not been cancelled, yeah. Now I thought Mark Keaton did a pretty good job on the, on the Vulture because we saw basically who, who who he was beforehand. Because in the flashback scene to to the first Avengers film, we saw. We saw that he was like a, he was like he was like a construction worker trying to clean up the mess from the Chitauri invasion, and we definitely and I, and I think it definitely had 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 a purpose in this film, to, which was simple to try and take out Spider Man. And oh my God, that scene when it was revealed that um, he was his uh, love interest Liz's dad, that was awkward. I was like, oh Peter, you've outdone yourself big time, mate. And. And and yeah, as for Tony Stark being in the film, whilst I was a worried at first, um, he would have he would have too much of a role and, and would dominate the film. In all fairness, he he could he he got his um, fair amount of screen time w- w- without underdoing it or overdoing it. And it was good to see the, the, the kind of mental relationship between 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 the two characters develop further than than we saw in Civil War. And seeing the Iron Spider suit at the at the end of the film, where Peter Parker was officially going to be introduced as a new Avenger, was quite cool. Seeing the Iron Spider suit. Now, obviously, we we will see we we will see it in action in Infinity War, and well, well, there were there were a few hint there there were a couple more hints towards Infinity War, especially as uh, as Gwyneth Paltrow made her first appearance as Pepper Potts since Iron Man Three. And obviously, sort to get engaged, which obviously will be one of the focal points of Infinity War. It, it kind of sets in motion what's next for, for, for Tony Stark. And personally, I think while Homecoming, I enjoyed it. It was nowhere near as good as the uh, Tobey Maguire films, in my opinion. And well, how, how well it was definitely, a, and I definitely praised the acting and the um, and the. And and the, and the fact that it was a it was a very di- di- different take to the to, to the previous films and and I personally look, look forward to seeing Spider Man in, in the next two Avengers movies and well I look forward to uh, to the uh, sequel tone coming next year and seeing what what that will bring which I rate I I rate the film I'd say a eight eight point five eight eight point five out of ten so yeah that's um my view on it so. I will hand you over to Tom, who will give his rather right in, in, in his opinion on it. So okay, be, so it's a warning. He may get loud on this. <laughs> right. So if you're all expecting me to say that I like, um, I love this and this, throw it out the window. Just chuck it in the bin. Oh, right. I'm gonna start off with saying the good things about it. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into it because it's pretty simple. Acting good. You know, up to par. Everything. Think. Char- character development up there, I guess. It's there, I suppose. And CGI. All three, good. Right, so... Oh, no. I would say that this is the worst Marvel film I've seen. And it's tragic for me that I have to say that. Because I grew up loving the again you can hear from my previous statements that I love Spider-Man I grew up with the superheroes so so I just yes Mimi alright sorry so I have this you know standard with Spider-Man so unfortunately when I see people trying to change the formula I have to make. I want to see that how they do it, and you know, and how it can be handled. Because if it's not handled well, it just becomes a disaster. Which was exactly this film. To me, it was a disaster. 
So me and a friend, uh, we went to see it because we were curious about it. And we both came out thinking, what was that? That was the worst Spider-Man film we've ever seen. So I'm going to start off with um, the villain. It was a crap villain. It was an utterly crap villain. Now granted, he did have a backstory and he had a reason. But it was a very, very poor reason. He got fired from his job, so he just decides to rob banks. Now, you could say, oh, that, that's a bit of a, it's a fair reason. No, it's not. Because, again, it takes book, it takes a lesson from the how to do a boring villain kind of cliche, where it's like, oh, I got fired from my job. Oh, well, time to rob banks. It's like, it's stupid. It doesn't make me feel sympathy for the villain at all. Like, if his family was poor, or he was struggling with finance, I could give some sympathy. But he isn't. He's quite rich, in fact. He's living a decent life. So for the sole fact that he's fired, and then he goes to decide, and then he just decides to rob things, in my opinion, it is a poor excuse. Now, when it comes, my biggest tribe with it is many things now um the story of the whole thing it's all right i guess yeah i should probably also add that to the list of good things the story was all right i wouldn't consider it the best um it, it's not that bad you know it you know it's it's understandable in some ways and stuff uh, so, God. Okay, so, the reason why I don't like Tom Holland's Spider-Man is because, one, I don't like the idea of him having an AI suit. Um, because, I like, the reason why I like Spider-Man is because he was a, because he was a normal person, a teenager, who actually crafted it himself. So, I don't like the idea of having, of Spider-Man having an AI system assisting him and everything, because it was not that... It didn't feel like a Spider-Man movie at all. And my biggest utterly stupid freaking thing about the movie was they took away the spider sense. The one thing that made Spider-Man Spider-Man. If the previous films have brought that up and then all of a sudden, oh no, we're just going to get rid of that, you've kind of fucked yourself. Because... <sighs> I don't know why they did that. It's but it's just to show. It's just basically to fill in that Iron Man mental role. And if I had to be honest, I didn't want. I didn't want Iron Man to be in the film because it was unnecessary to me. I just wanted Peter Parker, Peter Parker, not Iron Man coming in and you know doing stuff. And also, speaking of Iron Man, they lied in the trailer. Now in the trailer. Um, there is a scene where Spider-Man swings along with Iron Man following him. Guess what? You never see that in the movie. You never, never, never see that in the movie. So they purposely did that to to trick us into seeing it, which is a goddamn poor excuse for Marvel to make. And the fact that, like, you know, it constantly, you know, it gave me good movies all this time. So why did it need the 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 potential? Why did he decide to lie to me? I really do not know. Okay, now, my biggest con and also another big contrib is, like I said in the Civil War thing, I don't like Aunt May. I really do not. The whole fact that she's the sexy aunt and everything, it doesn't fly through me because, like I said, I see Aunt May as an old wise person that sort of guides Peter, Peter into doing the right thing because Peter is a teenager, so he doesn't even he doesn't know everything. You know, he doesn't know what is right and what is wrong to do. Well, he he understands it, you know, generally, but in terms of properly, not quite. So Aunt May is sort of that encouraging device to say, you know, you can do this, or like, you know, you know, blah 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 blah. So let's give an example, right? So look at Spider Man Three. Um, she talks about, you know, how people, you know, they can easily get corrupted with power and enjoyment. 
And she gives a reference to, like, Venom when he gets the Venom suit. He sa she says, power is like a Venom. It takes over you and it makes you change. And that's exactly what she said. And it ties in with, you know, Peter Parker getting the black suit. It's changing him into some way. That's why I like Aunt May. She's a... She's all, to me, she's the mentor of Spider-Man. Not fully, but she is the mentor, to me, of Spider-Man. So, to see her as this young Aunt May constantly being hit on, it doesn't make me feel comfortable at all. It just makes me feel not comfortable at all. And, it's, and to see my favourite hero as well, Stark, hitting on Aunt May, it's not good for me at all. Not at all. And another thing they stupidly do is... Now, in the previous two Spider-Man films and in the whole Spider-Man universe, Harry Osborn is Spider-Man's best friend. Guess what? She's not in the movie. Now, you can do this. But do not replace it with a character that I couldn't give an utter fuck about. Neil is is a Ned, sh Ned is the <laughs> worst character in this goddamn movie. He really is. He is just freaking there for comedy relief. There's no interesting thing about him. There's nothing at all. He's just there for goddamn entertainment. Now, you can't you could have just done this with Harry Osborn. He the reason why Peter Parker is so lonely is because he finds it hard to make friends. So Harry Osborn, this key essential character, is Peter's best friend. So to go and kick him out of a place with a stupid knockoff of a of a kid who has never been who has never been in the comics, or at least from what I've seen, I've never seen him in the comics, I've never seen him in the games, never, 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 never. And just replace him with that is just utterly inexcusable and utterly poor. And it's just utterly insulting to the whole Spider-Man universe. It is utterly insulting. Now, the love interest. I couldn't give a goddamn crap about her. She was not a good love interest. The reason why I preferred Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane in the two in the Andrew Garfield and in the Tobey Maguire guys because they had character. They had a reason why Peter loved them. Mary Jane always provided constant support to Peter. Even if she was he was at his down times, he constantly offered she constantly offered support to him. Oh, well, you have to excuse me. Gwen Stacy, the first love interest of the Spider-Man, you know, universe and everything. Again, she offered constant support to Peter. And she, she had so many likeable features to her that made me feel sad when she was killed off because his that death had an impactful thing to Peter. So this one love interest called Linda. Now, Liz. Liz. Now, Liz is in the comics. And Liz was in an animated TV show. So it's justifiable for her to be the new love interest. I can perfectly understand that. But she was poorly developed. Utterly poorly developed. There's nothing interesting about her at all. Like, every time we see her, she doesn't have any interesting things for Peter to, you know, to carry on. No words of wisdom or anything to encourage her on. She's just the typical high school love interest. That's it. So when it's revealed that her dad is the villain, I wasn't surprised or anything. I was kind of just like, okay. Oh, I... I couldn't give a fuck. Because I just hated her. She wasn't good at all. So when the part when it came to the end where you're supposed to feel sorry for her, I didn't feel sorry for her one bit. I was kind of just like, good, get rid of her. I don't like her. And now I'm going to move on. Now, this is going to be the most controversial thing I'll say. I'm not saying that the, now you can take this any way you want. But what I'm about to say, I'm not going to I'm not going to be racist in any point. But what, I'm, what I'll say is what I think from my heart. I'm not saying it's bad. Well, it depends. It really depends. Okay, so in movies, sometimes movie casts, movies think it's important to have diversity, which is understandable. 
because you want to show like a role model to children, um, especially with Marvel. Show a role model for children and, you know, to make them inspired to continue to do something like that. So, now, th this can also be your greatest downfall as well. Now, during the time that this film came out, Marvel Comics have been having issue issues recently because they had a pandering problem. Pandering is when you put too much diversity in there that you lose an audience themselves. So, for example, they have they basically all the main characters that made that superhero, so Peter Parker, Thor, and everyone, they're killed off. But they're replaced with the most panderous kind of characters, such as Asian Hulk, Black, Black, um, Black Iron Man, Asian Hawkeye, female Thor. You get, you get my point. So, unfortunately, Homecoming does has that exact same problem. It has a clear panda. Ned is the fat Asian. The love interest is black. And the big bully, Flash Thompson, is Arabic. And that's all I can say. They, the, the, it's so stupid. I don't understand why, you know, films are constantly worried by diversity. I can understand why. Because, unfortunately, the day that we live in now, we can't say, we can't pretty much do anything. If we don't show any blacks, we're automatically presumed racist. If we just do, I, anyway, I'm getting a f I'm on top of myself. What I really don't like is that the fact that Flash Thompson is Arabic. That's I now you could say, oh, I'm just being racist or whatever. You can take it that way. I don't care. The reason why Flash Thompson was made scary is because he was big. He was strong. It was the reason why Peter feared him. He was the big bully. He didn't want to get beat up. So you could portray Flash as the big, tough, you know, tough guy as Arabic. You could do that, and I wouldn't have a problem. It was the fact that he was smaller than Peter and was not strong enough. As you know, he didn't look strong at all. So it kind of makes you think: Why was Peter afraid of Flash Thompson if he was a taller than him and two looked stronger than him? I really don't know why. So, and then there's Tony Stark. Now. I don't mind if you need to show another hero in the film, as long as it's done right, like Thor Ragnarok, that apparently um, I hear about, you know, people say that it's one of those movies where it actually st it's a good movie, and that the Hulk serves a good purpose. So like I said, you need to make it necessary. Unfortunately for Tony Stark, it is not necessary. I felt like he didn't need to be there at all. Well, I can understand if he needed to be there in the beginning and in the end, but the but the times when he's in the middle, it just kind of it just doesn't really feel like a Spider-Man movie to me. It feels a bit of a Spider-Man slash Iron Man kind of movie, because uh, it doesn't properly feel like a Spider-Man movie. I'm not, you know, seeing Peter trying to, you know, impress Stark. Well, I don't know how to say this, but... I just wish that Tony Stark wasn't that involved in the movie. I wished he would only be in the beginning and the end. I don't want him anywhere else in the movie. And again, that the fact that they lied to us in the trailer is the biggest utter downfall of this movie. Okay, so, yeah, so, in conclusion, I would rate this movie uh, a very poorly 2 out of 10. And I can, like I said, great acting, you know, great acting, CGI, still there, decent story, but there are just so many negative things about it that I can't really, you know, go back to. So, we're going to move on to Thor Ragnarok, and I haven't seen this movie, so I'll let um, Elliot. Okay. And actually, and... It was because of Spider-Man Homecoming that I didn't see Thor Ragnarok because I was just afraid that they were going to make the same mistake. So, carry on. Ooh, well, have to fall asleep through that. Yeah. Um, I'm back. Yeah. So, 
Okay, so we're moving on to the 17th installment of the MCU, and that is indeed Thor Ragnarok, the third and final installment in the Thor trilogy. Now, um, so in Thor Ragnarok, it picks up two years after the events of Avengers Age of Ultron, and Thor's become a bit of a lone gunslinger who's, a, who's, on, who's on a quest to find out more information about the, the, the Infinity Stones. But however, when when he, when he returns home to Asgard, he finds him he f he finds himself teaming up with uh, Loki once again. And and well, basically, he he finds himself he, he finds himself stranded stranded on stranded, stranded on an alien planet called Sakaar, and then and then runs into it and then runs into it to, to his old friend and, and fellow Avenger, Bruce Banner, aka the Hulk, and. And well, he has he has to go back to Asgard in time to stop his evil sister Hela from uh, taking over Asgard, and and of course the impending Ragnarok, which is of course um, mythology. Take take from the mythology. Now, what can I say? I think for Ragnarok is easily the best four film out of all three of them. I think it was literally a massive improvement over the over four and four of the Dark World. I don't know why, but it, it was it was like a 1970s, 1980s kind of sci-fi sci comedy in, in my mind. Whereas if he, because because whereas it featured the Hulk, which which uh, partly adapted the um, Planet Planet Hulk storyline from the comics, which I thought was really good. And the, and the, and the fact that Hela was actually quite a strong female villain, which I loved. The the the, the fact that Marvel had a had a f f female villain in it, which I feel they need to do more often. We knew, we, we, we knew she was, we knew she was, um, she was, she was uh, Odin's uh, other child who we didn't know about. But, but the interesting thing about Ragnarok was the fact that, um, like I'm, like, like I'm a free and Captain America Civil War, it deconstructed four, but, but ten times more than Iron Man and Captain America. Reasons being is because because the fact that well, well Hella dis Hella destroyed his hammer Miona. He he then he then had a, he then had his hair cut short and then and then and then he, and they lost an eye and um, and well Asgard got got destroyed. It essentially stripped him down to a, to a re re refugee essentially. And and uh, yes, it, it does include. Quite a few hints and teasers towards Avengers: Infinity War, because by the end of Ragnarok, you're left wondering what's next for Thor. Just you know, now that he's lost his hammer, he's had his hair cut short, he's lost an eye, and he's well, he Asgard's gone for good. It, it really makes you wonder what's going to happen for Thor next. So, 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 so really, so really, Thor: Ragnarok was was easily. The best four film out of all three of them, because because I love its humor, its style, and 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 the good, and and Hella is easily one of the best MCU villains by far. And well, if ever, if if Chris Hemsworth decides to return as four for a four 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 movie, then I definitely think it should, it, it should happen because. But they've actually gone and reinvented Thor in so many ways, and I think I think there's more to do with his character than ever. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give Thor Ragnarok a solid ten out of ten because I just can't fault it whatsoever. It literally is one of the MCU's strongest films in my mind. So yeah, that's Thor Ragnarok number for you. And now we're getting on to a major film here. Which was the first MCU release of 2018, and that is, of course, the 18th storm of the MCU, Black Panther. Okay, so I've actually seen this movie, so I can finally, hmm. you know, get in it. All right, so after you, Tom. All right, so uh, right. I will say this now that um, Black Panther is really good. It is definitely worth a watch. It's because it's good to see a Marvel movie back to its original kind of ways of like, you know, sticking to the superhero title like it should be. 
after the major disappointment of Spider-Man Homecoming, I needed to feel like the, the, the magic of Marvel. And Black Panther did that. They show it. It was good to see Black Panther as he is, without the help of any other superhero. Just a sole, you know, solo, you know, Black Panther movie. And I was really impressed by it. I really loved it, from the characters to the setting, and to the st even though the story is very similar to the Disney's Lion King, I would still say it's worth a watch. Uh, even though after, even though you might be listening to this um, not knowing about Black Panther, and I might just say that, and you've already seen The Lion King, I might have just <laughs> kind of spoiled it for you. <laughs> but, um, but I, I suppose it it is a bit different to the to The Lion King in some way. But if I had to be honest, it's very similar to The Lion King, unfortunately. But it's not that bad actually. It do, it doesn't copy every single element. It's um, it still, you know, shows a nice story for you to get invested with, and I would say that the biggest strength with Black Panther is that it finally gets the villain right. Warmonger is actually a very interesting villain, Killmonger. in my opinion, because um, he comes from the background of when um, you know, blacks were not really accepted during that time, and it, and because of the way Wakanda treats its people, his uncle was seen as a traitor. So when he was killed and abandoned by his people. A uh, war well, no war mongerer, um, kill mongerer. <laughs> Isn't that funny? War mongerer, kill mongerer, <laughs> kill mongerer. Felt was um decided that, you know, he had a reason to you know become the next king, and to show that you know Wakanda, you know, should not be taken you know lightly. We are a major force and everything. So it's very interesting to um to see that concept. And the CG, the CGI effects are beautiful, as well as the um, the Black Panther suit. I and I actually like the the whole like you know artificial you know suit yeah. coming together and everything. So it was it's that's all I can say. It's so so good. I would say it's one drawback feature is its jokes. Some of the jokes feel a bit unnecessary, like the what are those you know kind of thing. Do you remember them when that was going about? It was a bit stupid, so they make a reference to that joke, which is a bit stupid in my opinion. But but despite that, everything else is bloody brilliant, and I highly recommend you watch it. So for Black Panther, I will give it a 9.5 out of 10, and I hope and I hope that and I'm actually and I actually look forward to seeing his appearance in Infinity War. Okay, so. I think I pretty much agree with Tom on that. That's the same that's the same view as Tom. But what I also liked about Black Panther was the fact that it, it had a real kind of James Bond kind of kind of vibe to it. Essentially, it was like the James Bond of the Marvel Universe because because T'Challa he's so slick and stylish and just like just like James Bond is except except he's like a black James Bond. Cause he, has, Cause he has all the gadgets and all the, and like, and like the MI6 style yeah. style lab in, in Wakanda where all the gadgets and suits are made. I like the fact that they did like a casino royale kind of thing when yeah. he was in the casino. So yeah. that's another thing. And, <laughs> and the and the and the music, well, 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 soundtrack as well as the songs in it, they were just incredible. They just literally made the film so relevant to to, to the themes of it. And I liked how, well. When when there was like conflict between T'Challa and um, and Killmonger, it, it was like it was like T'Challa was Barack Obama and Killmonger w w was like Donald Trump in some ways. So so like so like how it made. I would I wouldn't compare it to that. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My opinion, it kind of um, felt relevant in that way, like it like like it's very similar to like to like Barack Obama and Trump, really. But that's, but, 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 but that's my opinion. Anyway, no, no one's agree with me necessarily. But yeah, I totally agree with Tom, and um, I, 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 I think we need more, more Marvel films with a, a black cast in it. Really, really, I do. And it, and it was great to see Martin Freeman back from the Civil War. He was a he was a really good addition to the to the film. And yeah, I would give Black Panther in my mind a ten out of ten from me. 
and more importantly, it deserves to be to be the to be the fifth MCU film to uh, to gross over one billion dollars box office as as it just made one point three billion at the uh, box office. So yeah, really good and well, fantastic. So moving on. So now we look to all the current films. It's time to look ahead in the final part to the future. Mm-hmm. So, at the current time of this podcast, um, Avengers Infinity War might have already come out, or it hasn't. And I do um, plan on um, making on like a, a review for my channel discussing about Avengers Infinity War, and you know my thoughts towards it. Now, this is the this is what the previous Marvel films have been doing. The previous eighteen Marvel films have been doing. They've been building this, you know this huge big event which was the Avengers Infinity War think of the Avengers as like a big project and all these are side projects so phase one blah 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 the big project Avengers then phase two Avengers Avengers Age of Ultron then the third one Avengers Infinity War now I hear loads and loads of rumours about it like you know who's going to die who what they're going to do and everything and I'm actually very curious to see it, and I will definitely make a, you know, try to see it as soon as I can. Now, however, I will say this, that um, we should not hype it to the, to that extent, because um, because Batman vs. Superman and Suicide Squad had the exact same thing. They were overhyped so much that when it actually came out it turned out to be disappointing so i fear that marvel could maybe on maybe end up on that road because there's been this big hype to this you know project that's been building up for so long for 10 years now yeah for 10 years and they're actually going to finally show it to to us i fear that it might go horribly wrong like it might do something really stupid but so far by seeing the trailers, it looks pretty good, and they're doing it in the right direction. Hope so. Hopefully, when I when I actually see it, they do a really properly good job, and you know they bring all the parts that I like about you know Marvel, and they fix the and especially with Black Panther, they've managed to you know improve on this villain problem. So maybe they might do the same thing for Thanos. However, I don't know that much about Thanos. I hear that apparently he's kind of just like this evil war general kind of thing. So, unless they do something in the film that makes me, you know, interested in Thanos, then I would that would be a big definite plus in this movie. Hmm. I mean, the question. I mean, the question is really, who who will survive and who's going to die? That's the most important thing. Mm. I mean. I've got a feeling that Captain America might die, because, because, it's, because, because in the trailer, right, in the recent trailer, when he, in the in the clip where he's uh, where he's uh, holding off Thanos's Infinity Garland, I've got a feeling he's he's he, he might have the uh, Soul Stone, because because he, if you saw closely, his eyes like change colour, they, they change to orange, hmm. so it's kind of obvious that um, he has a Soul Stone because. How else is he able to, to hold off the 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 the, the, the Garland, what the most powerful object in the universe? Mm. So it really makes you wonder that um, because Chris Evans has confirmed the fishery that um, Infinity War and Avengers Four, which is out next year, the, these two films will be his last as Captain America, and then he'll be stepping down, and then he'll be hanging up the shield after that. So really. So really, Infinity War and Avengers Four will be the end of the the end of the first three phases, and essentially the beginning of the next chapter. So really, how you see it is, Phase One, Phase Two, and Phase Three they make up Chapter One, where, where whereas everything from Phase Four onwards will will be Chapter Two. So I really enjoy watching the MCU films. I, I think it's been a fantastic ten years, you know, for for, for room making mm. and. I, and I really can't wait to see Infinity War and Ant-Man the Wasp and Captain Marvel, of course, and Avengers Four. Yeah. So really, I, I, and then I, and then and then when, when it all ends next year, 
I'm just really looking forward to seeing a face, to, to, to seeing what the future holds for Marvel beyond Avengers 4. So, Tom, obviously because X-Men and Fantastic Four are, are officially coming back to the MCU mm -hmm. for good, what what do you hope to see in, in, in the MCU beyond Avengers 4, for Phase 4 and beyond? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't really say that much because um, at this point um, I'm sort of in and out with Marvel because um, the trouble with um, with an ongoing franchise is that you need to somehow keep your audience, you know, connected. You know, why do you know why do I keep coming back to see them? So with Black Panther, they gave me a reason to come back. But because of Spider-Man Homecoming, they gave me a reason to why I'm not, why I shouldn't come back at all. So, Mimi. Mimi, hush. Shush. Shush. Oh. You alright? Or you? <laughs> so, as I was saying, sorry. Because of those two, I keep coming in and out, in and out. So I can't really say that much about, like, you know, my plans for, you know, the future franchise or whatever. Um... All I, can, all I can really say is that I just hope they do a good job of what they do. And obviously there's like loads and loads and loads of projects that are coming up like Captain Marvel, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Ant-Man and Wasp. It's, Which is that in July? It's really, it's really astonishing to see, you know, that this, that this franchise, ever since it started in 2008, it's continued on and on and on and on and on and on. And, and people love it. Yeah, and people somehow... And, and pe the fans are so... The, the dedicated to the franchise. Yeah, exactly. So, I just hope they just do good in the future. I mean, I mean, I mean, when the time for Fantastic Four does come to be to, to, to be rebooted in the MCU, I really hope Marvel do them do them justice. Really, I do. I mean, I mean, the question is, Tom, for you, who do you want to see play? play the new Fantastic Four in an in MCU reboot in the future. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those people who, like, you know, who make up those ideal casting because I'm not really that big of a movie expert in terms of, like, you know, I, th I think they, play, they should play this and this because you can pretty much write the character however you want in the film. So, uh, take uh, The Rock. Like, he's going to be playing Black Adam. Even though The Rock's not really Egyptian, and Black Adam is Egyptian, you can, you know, write it in a way that yeah. make it look like, you know, this. So, I can't really say much at all that about, like, you know, I think they should play this, they should play that, blah, blah, blah. So... Well, I'm in favour of um, someone like uh, Matt Smith for, for, for Reed, Reed Richards. Actually, yeah, I, I guess I would see him as Mr. Fantastic. And I, and I would say... Someone like Amelia Clark for um, Sue Storm, hmm. probably Zac Efron for Johnny Storm. I I'm not too sure who make a good Ben Grimm, but for Doctor Doom, I think someone like Jason Statham would be um, would be ideal f for the part. Hmm. But but I know really. I mean, I mean really. Come next year when when it comes to Avengers Four, it will truly be emotional because it because it is going to be the end of an era. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the end of what's been a, a, a fantastic by then eleven years. So, so, so essentially, it, 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 so, so, so essentially, it'll be it'll be the end of chapter one and the beginning of chapter two. Yeah, and it's astonishing. Again, it's just astonishing to see that you know ever since it began in two thousand eight, um, you see the DC, the rival and company, trying to do the same thing. They've they've announced so many plans for films. Like they so they released Man of Steel, Batman, um, Batman versus Superman, Suicide Squad, Suicide Wonder Squad, Woman, Wonder Justice Woman, Justice League, yeah, Justice League, and they and they got films coming up like Aquaman, Sh yeah. Shazam, Wonder Cyborg, Woman 2, Green Lantern Corps, yeah, Green Arrow, etc. So you can see DC are trying to do the exact same thing, but except but except that then they're a bit fumbling at the moment. But after seeing Justice League, they are stepping in the right direction. But uh, but we're not going to carry on talking about that. So, in conclusion, I just hope that, you know, a Marvel Affinity War does good and that they they continue to make, to continue, just have a path of succession of, you know, the Marvel Universe mm. and just keep expanding it and adding new characters mm. to the whole thing and whatever. I reckon Affinity War is going to make history because I reckon if, I reckon if it's really success successful and gets less people seeing it, 
Now this is a big if, I reckon Avengers Infinity War could potentially become the first ever film to, 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 to gross three billion dollars at the box office worldwide. I, I reckon it might just 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 be Avatar at yeah. the box office. In fact, in fact, um, as the current making of this podcast, they all they're already selling like you know pre-order tickets to see Infinity War, and I've never seen a movie do that before. So yeah, selling um, that is actually. It, that is actually really surprising to me to see that a movie is offering pre-tickets yeah. for you to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Selling more than the previous seven MCU movies combined. Mm-hmm. Now, now, I, now, I of course have put my tickets in advance because because me and my mate Dom Alice are going to watch it on on the 27th of April, which is which is which is the day after it comes out in the UK. So, so I will be posting. So I, I will do a review. On, uh, on Parsons Media, media Studios about Infinity War yeah, and I will share my spoiler free thoughts about it and, it, and, and it'll be the same with me after I've seen the movie um, it, I'll probably just explain every single part of the movie um, so it will, it will be a bit spoilerish but that's what you get when you're reviewing a movie so um, this concludes the, the Marvel podcast I'd like to thank um, Parsons Media Studios for joining me this evening Thank to you. discuss about the, the Marvel movies in general and our opinions from the very first thing to the very last to the very last thing and uh, 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 and of course our, our hopes for the future of the MCU mm-hmm. if you'd like to um, see more of me um, my channel is Thomas Obeidy and you can probably find it on the Spark Gaming website if you'd like to see more of Elliot's kind of um, kind Lo- of logging. content and side go to Parsons Media Studios. So, like I said, this concludes the podcast. I'd like to thank you for, you know, listening and just have a great night or afternoon that you're listening to this. Bye-bye.